Okay, I'm good to go. Thank you, Kendra. All right, where was I? Anyway, just speak up. When you have a chat, please chat to everyone and not just directly to me um, because I can't promise that I'll be able to keep up with the chat. So hopefully all of you were able to get the email that I sent you late last night with the handout. Um, we can, we will email these out. Uh, we, Karen already sent you guys the manual along with the crediting handbook a couple weeks ago. So you should have that. Um, but there's quite a other things that we really wanted to go over with you guys. And I'm really bummed out that we won't have um, those of you in person because we were going to try to do some activities. So the activities I had planned, we're just going to kind of talk about the things we wanted to go over and we will make it work. So again, thank you guys for being here. We've got a good crowd. I just want to remind everyone that this is a training for family daycare home sponsors. So if you're not a family daycare home, sponsor. Um, you're welcome to stick around and listen, but none of this will really apply to you. So I see some new names. Maybe that just means we've got lots of new people in our with our sponsors. So that's great. As a disclaimer, I hope um, my dog will cooperate throughout the day, but if you hear snoring or barking, <laughs> my dog is behind me. So um, it's going to be an interesting day. We'll get started. But like I said, interrupt me. I have a tendency to ramble. You guys are used to that. So when you have questions, just speak up. All right. So again, we it's um we've got Karen on here as well. Um I don't know that we'll take the whole day. We've got quite a bit to go over. Um so we'll we'll try not to carry on too much, but I do feel like we'll probably take the majority of the day because there's a lot of things um, that we need to cover. All right, so I already mentioned the manuals and handouts. Um, I hope you were able to print some of the things that I suggested that you print just so it's easier to kind of go over. Um, but just a few housekeeping things. If you had multiple people watching on one registration, and I did see several of you mention that you had um, more than one of you, just to ensure that we give you all credit because training is now required, as you know, go ahead and do a sign in sheet for all those individuals there with you. Um, even if you've all registered and send it to Karen and me uh, so we can make sure everyone gets a certificate because you are going to have to make sure you keep those on file. I mean, you always had to have training records on file anyhow, um, but it's, it's particularly important now because we are requiring it um, as part of application renewal. So anyone who has any type of um, PUCFP duties, regardless of how small or how big it is, has to have training. But that doesn't mean they have to be here at this training. So if at least one person from your institution is here getting training, um, you can take our information back and as always train, train your staff. Um, afterwards, this is recorded. So we can send you all the link. You're welcome to share the link and let them watch it that way. But just make sure that everyone that has any responsibilities are being trained. And already said, please, you know, mute your mic, use the chat box when at all possible, but send the messages to everyone because I can't promise I'll be able to keep up. Okay. So, um, the training kind of, it pretty much flows along with the manual. So if you have your manual, go ahead and you can refer to it. It kind of goes in the same order and some of it's repetitive. Y'all are used to that, but First, we'll just kind of go over your basic responsibilities and then we'll go over all of them in depth. But um, it's just those things we have to cover every year. So prior to beginning, ever operating as a family daycare home sponsor, there's things that you have to do and um, then do yearly. So new sponsors must provide um, or prove a need that there, um, there's a need for those for a new sponsorship in that area. We haven't really had any new, any new people trying to come on because really our areas are pretty saturated, as you know. Um, even if you're trying to expand to another area, it's kind of hard right now, especially with COVID. Um, but you know, you got to complete an application, um, yearly administrative budget. You have to prove financial viability and administrative capability and program accountability, which we'll touch more on that later. And you also have to have a 501c3, but you guys already know that. 
you have to have certain policies, um, procedures, procurement plans. You have to develop outreach materials and instruction, instruction materials for your providers, which you guys, I mean, these are, although there are things you have to do prior to beginning your operation, you have to continue doing them throughout your op operation. Um, comply with the Civil Rights Act of 1964, have a current DEMS number, and have access to the NDL. So that's really important. So the, the individual is responsible. Um, so individuals responsible for putting any new providers on need to have access to that. So they can check the national, national disqualified list and ensure that we're not putting anyone on the program. We double check it too, but you guys have to do it before you even send it to us. Um, and I'm sure that I will mention stuff multiple times throughout this training, but as things pop in my head, I just say them because I, I don't want to forget. So um, we are going to start asking that you guys check the NDL on application renewal every year um, because we found instances where things have slipped through the cracks. And so if somehow someone accidentally gets on the program and they are on the NDL, um, it's unfortunate, but if it's happened to you, we've all panicked and we know it's happened, it happened just this last year. So we just, as a safety measure, if you aren't already doing it, check them again every year at application renewal and just save that proof. Um, and as always, when you're searching that NDL, less is more. So if you just put like a first name or a last name and a birth date versus their name, their address and all that, all the different parameters you can search for, less is more so you can try to search for all those possible different you know, name variances. Anyway, I'm sure we'll talk about that again. Um, after beginning your operation, uh, you obviously have to cooperate with USDA in conducting evaluations and research. So you've all, we, we kind of lucked out this last year. I don't think, I don't think we've had one this last year, but if it, an institution reaches out to you and says they're conducting research on behalf of USDA, and they want information from you, um, it's probably always a good idea. Generally, we know beforehand and we can kind of give you a heads up, but sometimes we don't. Um, so, you know, it's always a good idea to reach out to us first and just ask to make sure it's legitimate, but you do really have to participate unless you have some really good reasoning why you can't, you can't participate in those researches. And they're usually not very consuming. They just usually pick some random providers for certain data and it's not that bad. And as always, you got to maintain your itemized receipts, invoices, payroll, all those things about your administrative costs. Um, and it's, your records have to always be available for review and audit. You guys know that. It's becoming even more important now because um, our state auditors are requiring us to collect all that and keep copies of it all. So if you haven't experienced a review in the last two years, it's coming up because um, you have to be the way, our, um, mon or the way our administrative reviews go for family daycare homes and sponsors. If you didn't know, if you have 100 or more, you get reviewed every other year, basically. And if you have less than, it's, it's, every, it's on our three-year cycle. It's regulatory that we have to review everyone, you know, um, three times or once every three years. So if you haven't been up for a review yet, you're coming. And if you've not experienced having to collect all that and us have to maintain copies of all of it, it's a pain. Um, but we've got different ways to do that to lessen the burden. And I know there's some concerns with, you know, we're having to take financial information and copies away from your institution. So we have secure ways for you to share that with us. Um, so if you ever have concerns when your consultants come out and um, them taking copies of any of your documentation, please, you know, express that to them because we have other ways to keep it secure without them taking actual papers um, from your institution. Um, okay, so when you're not using SCE forms, you have to make sure that your forms are as good as or better than ours. And so I know we'll talk about that again, but a lot of you do create your own forms. And they pretty much mirror um, what we create, but you got to make sure, especially that like your monitoring review form and your pre-approval, it, it has to have all that information on there um, because it is something we look at in a review and it could make you not compliant. You have to keep your records for the current year and three past years. You guys know that. We kind of just have to see that you are maintaining them when we come out for a review. Um, you got to conduct your pre-approval visits prior to participation. Um, and children, children need to already be enrolled and they already need to be operating before you can conduct these. 
So that's something that I know it's kind of been, um, we've never really put that in writing, I don't think, because I know um, we've had provider ad forms and you guys have added people when there's been zero enrollment and we've kind of put a stop to that this year, so much so that you can't even enter a provider um, on the application and put the enrollment as zero because you, you have to have it where they're already operating before you report them to us because then as soon as you report them to us and they're approved, um, your clock starts for when your pre-approval is your pre-approval visits, you know, required. So it's important that you don't start that clock any sooner than it needs to be because then you're going to risk being out of compliance. Um, for not getting that pre or that first visit within four weeks, I mean, done. Um, you got to do annual training for your staff um, and your providers. And you got to use the most current data for tier one. Um, all that tiering determination stuff we'll talk about in depth later. You got to notify your providers um, what tier they are. And you have to be responsible for how you're collecting your FSIAs for all, all your tiering, you know homes that you collect them on. You got to monitor your home. You've got to conduct annual training. That was already said. And then you've got to have your written applications and agreements with your family daycare homes. Um, applications and agreements. Like I said, all this is very, we're going to go over this in depth. So I'm kind of just skimming along here. But um, the applications and agreements that you have to do every year is your sponsor application, your budget, your management plan and agreement, which um, your management plan is kind of incorporated with, not kind of, it's, it's your policies and procedures and all that that you are detailing on your sponsor application. You have to redo your provider applications and agreements every year. And we'll be looking at that. And I guess I already said this, we're gonna go over tiering really good um, because we're kind of finding some instances in reviews when we're not quite getting that right um, for, for several, Sponsors, so I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Okay, already said all this. Resource library, you guys are very familiar. Um, I think everything that I'm referencing today that I've emailed you is in the resource library. If not, it will be after we're done here. Um, I, if you haven't gotten the handout, I did have someone email me shortly before. Um, the training started and said they didn't get the packet and I tried to email it to them and it came back undeliverable because it's such a large file. So I apologize for that, but I'll find a better way to get those to you after the fact or when we break. So my apologies. Um, we did get Karen got the um, updated manual in resource library yesterday. So you do have the FY22 manual available for you in there. Okay, so you must send all provider permits and licenses in. You guys know that. Make sure you're putting your name um, or their, their name, their operating name, and their number on it so that we can keep them organized. Um, make sure they're kept up to date. If anything changes on that license, we have to have the current copy. If the provider moves, I, we have to have the updated um, address. I know that DHS takes their time sometimes on getting those um, updated forms to us, but we have to have them. So just work with, sometimes we have to work with licensing, even if they can just give us some information other than um, the actual license that we can use in lieu of. Um, and we monitor it until we can get the actual document. It usually doesn't take more than a month, but as soon as I say that, Karen, speak up if I misspeak on anything. Um, but no matter what, we have to have the most up-to-date information in our system, or we can't we can't pay them. Nor should you be paying them. Okay, so site maintenance. That's one of our most important areas, and we've got some changes coming to that. Um, and I'll talk about that here in a minute. But for right now, for application renewal, which we're anticipating the, the new applications to be live um, sometime towards the end of August. So uh, you won't be able to start that application till then. But for right now, you know, go in there and make sure all your information is up to date as possible. Because then when we roll over, 
that's a little less work for you to do um, when, when the application gets inserted. Site maintenance, you have to have, we, I think we've got everybody fixed now where we've changed where you have to put in four digits just because we've got so many people in our system now that we had to go from three digit requirement to be four. Um, so make sure you get that in there. Um, if you only have numbers, you'll see the example here. Oops, I clicked forward. Put zeros, preceding zeros if you just have numbers that are just two digits or three digits. You guys already know that. Um, okay, so the names, how we need to enter the names when a provider is operating under a business name. Right, addresses should not be changed in the system until the updated license is received, like Karen said. And that is happening a lot. And this last thing I'll mention here will be the change that's going to help prevent that. But when a provider is operating under a business name rather than their own name, we need to list the DBA in our in operating field so that we don't lose track. Because sometimes our licenses will say their name or it'll say their operating name, DBA, their name, whatever. If that's the case and they operate with any other name other than just their name, we need to know that too. Um, and so make sure that th that's what the difference is between operating name and then down in that section where it's owner, provider, we put their actual name. Okay, so like Karen said, uh, changes should not be made in site maintenance when there isn't supporting documentation, um, such as so the address or I can't really think of anything else, a license capacity. So beginning in fiscal year 22, or basically when the application rolls over, we will be um, restricting your access to site maintenance. So you won't be able to update these things anymore. Um, we had to do this a while ago with our sponsor, sponsors of centers because it just became overwhelming. It's really hard for us to know what you've changed and keep up with it and then have to backtrack and get that documentation. So to prevent that, um, we're just going to maintain site maintenance ourselves going forward next year. So if there's any change that you need made in site maintenance, you can go in there and view it, but you can't save any changes. So it will only be um, readable, read only for you guys. You also will not be able to remove the providers yourself. That remove button will be disabled. So anticipate that coming like I said, it'll be at least the end of next month. So if there's anything you need to get in there and update, please do it, but don't do it without the supporting documentation being submitted first. Any questions on that? Okay. You guys already know this. Um, we have to have a color copy of a provider's driver's license or government issued ID. It has to be on file. Black and white is not acceptable because sometimes those are pretty hard to make out. It's going to be a pretty good picture. The, the whole point we're doing this is not because we want to know they have a valid driver's license. We just need an official way to identify individuals. Um, we experienced it a lot on the, on the center side of things where do we need a color, color ID for helpers also. Uh, no. We do not. We just need it for the um, provider. Um, because the reason is, is we've got to make sure we're, we know the individual who's responsible because they're the one that if something happens will end up on the NDL. And we've had situations, like I said, it happens far on the center side where we show up and they're like, I'm not that person, but they really are. And we had no way to know before without asking to see licenses. Um, or whatever, some type of ID. But I know from, I mean, I can speak from personal experience when I was with the sponsor for, there were, for a few years, there was an individual who I thought her name was one thing. And it wasn't until we came into training and then she signed her name. And I'm like, wait a second, that I just made the assumption that was her because that's always who I saw, that's who I spoke with. And then she signed her name and it was something different. And it was the daughter. <laughs> so anyway. It's just, it happens, um, and we got to make sure we know who's who. But we're not concerned that it, it's, if it's expired. We just want that official picture to know who they are. So don't stress about keeping updated licenses. If they expire, we don't care. And like I said, I already kind of went over this about the NDL. 
Um, less is more. So just use first name and date of birth. Uh, sometimes I don't even put date of birth. Sometimes I'll just put like the first letter of their name and, and the last name. So you might try searching, you know, a, a couple of different ways for each one. I know it sounds tedious, but it's better than accidentally missing something and putting someone on and paying them when they shouldn't be paid. Okay, provider ad form. So that's one of the first, I think that's the first form in that packet of stuff. Um, nothing, we didn't change anything about this one. Um, but don't send this form without the required supporting documentation, such as like your driver's license or DHS license. Um, they don't send the driver's license in, do they? I don't do, I don't deal with that side of stuff, Karen. So when I say something wrong, let me know. <laughs> but especially a DHS license. If there's any type of supporting information needed, send it. And make sure it's the most current updated form, right? So if you're unsure what the most current form is, always go back to our resource library because it's gonna be the one in there. It has to be submitted to, um, to us within 10 days of the pre-approval. That's just so we can ensure it gets in there. Um, we're, gonna, we're kind of redoing our, our processes and how we're doing things in the office just to kind of to try to be more efficient and get things done timely. Um, but like I've said before, Karen, her position is different than it was for Edgar or Dee or myself when I had that uh, had that family daycare home role at the state. She's not just family daycare home coordinator. She's coordinator of all sponsors. And so um, she can't always get to her things as quick as what we've always been used to. So going forward, the plan is, is um, you got to send this to her within 10 days of the pre-approval. Doesn't mean we won't add it if you're late. It just means there's no guarantee that it's going to get in there in time for you to claim if you send it to us and it's past that deadline and you need it in there because you're trying to get the claim in right away. So send it in as soon as you can. And then she's going to process, process these forms on a Monday. So that would give you ample time that if you're trying to get the claim in there for Tuesday, um, that you would still have that time. So. Just keep that in mind. It's got to be sent to her within 10 days. It's got to be on the current form and she'll process them on a Monday. Um, and I already said this, don't add a provider until they're ready to participate. It starts that clock and you don't want to be out of compliance for not having conducted that first visit within the first four weeks, which is 28 operating days um, from the first date operating date. And you guys know that. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. So we've had this instance. It's, it's been more common in the last couple of years. I don't know what what's going on, but we've had it where a provider. I don't know. I'm, I think the list goes out of new providers and I don't know if y'all are all contacting them or if they're getting the list. The providers are getting the list from DHS because I know sometimes they supply them a list of um, family daycare home sponsors, but they're somehow getting signed up with a, a, two different sponsors at the same time. And then simultaneously they're getting it to us and we're like, well, who are they gonna sign with? And so it's frustrating because now you have two sponsors who've done all the work and all the training and why on earth the provider didn't let you guys know, I have no idea. So, I mean, I, I would encourage you that when you're going, you know, that first phone call when you're talking to someone, Reiterate to them, like you can only be with one sponsor. Have you have you already talked to another sponsor? Um, or have you already signed any paperwork? Because um, it's frustrating. I mean, we had one that just happened, I think, last month, and we've kind of just left it up to where, okay, the provider's not approved. That it's been sent in. We got the pre-approval, and on this last one, they both they both already had them in the system. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We basically had to just go back to the provider and let her choose what she wanted to do, which is not really fair to the sponsor who has already done a lot of work. So I go on to say I'm not sure. I'm not sure the best way to handle that. I think we need to talk about it. Um, I don't know if we want to go back to somehow doing those um, contract renewals and have an actual. I mean, you guys already have them sign the application and agreement. So I mean, I really think we're going to have to enforce that if. If something, you went out there and did training and something was signed and dated, 
we're going to have to go by whoever, whatever that date was first and not let the provider choose like we've done before because that's just really not fair. I don't know. The same thing's kind of happening with um, existing providers when we roll over. Like, I think most of you guys still do like what we, what we're used to called the renewal application. Because many years ago, I think it changed in 2012 when um, it changed to where we didn't have to do that renewal anymore. And I think that, well, I know why that happened. Like the agreement is permanent. And the state was had, had a form for us to fill out that was a renewal every year. And USDA was like, well, they don't have to renew it every year because it's permanent. So that's why that went away. I think for the most part, a lot of you guys still um, created your own and implemented a renewal because you have to know that. You have to be able to gauge what you know, how to budget for the next year. And I totally get it. So I don't know if we need to maybe implement some type of renewal form so that everyone is using one for those that aren't doing it or speak up if everyone's doing a renewal. I don't know. I just, I'm trying to figure out how to handle this the best so that we can better make, you know, make sure our providers better understand that you can't switch to a sponsor within, you know, within the same year. And also so that you have a way to know that um, when you go into the new year, they haven't suddenly switched to another sponsor with without your knowledge. So I've kind of humored the idea of creating a renewal again, that it's not renewing their agreement because it's a permanent agreement, but rather maybe renewing their information, maybe just an application renewal. I don't know, because those applications are supposed to be updated every year. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on that? Quiet. Hey, hey, Cassie. Uh huh. This is Donald. We we do that now. We send one out every year that has the updated information on it, and they sign it and say they want to be with us the upcoming year. So we've been doing that since we started every uh, October. Yeah, and I think a lot of you, I really think a lot of you are. So I don't know if it would be necessary for us to create one, but I think I might. We might do that just so we have one available, and then just make it make it required that you have something in writing. I don't know, because it's just, I know it's frustrating when suddenly you're going into the new year and now they've, there was someone else and you didn't even know. So I don't know, just think about that if you have thoughts on it, speak up. Um, but I really do think on the thing with the brand new providers, um, when you first talk to them, just explain it to them. You do a partial contract every year. I think everyone does some kind of contract. So um, I think that might be the route we go. It'll be one of those things where maybe we create a form and provide it. And if you have one that's equal to or better than, just so everybody's doing something. So everyone has something that the providers are signing and we've got a date. Um, but with those brand new ones, you're just gonna have to make sure they understand and just say like, hey, have you talked to another sponsor yet? Um, and if so, I mean, explain to them that you can't really help them if they've already signed something. I don't know what's going on. Okay. Next. The provider drop form. So this is another one we're kind of having a, a tough time making sure they're, um, they're, they're sent in and we're not just leaving inactive um, providers on your list. Long time ago, I don't remember if it was just the policy I created when I was a, at a sponsor or if it was a state thing. There's a lot of those things that I don't know where they came from, but I know right now it's not a state policy, but I, but we are going to start implementing it. That if after three months a provider is inactive, they need to be removed um, because they don't need to be on, they don't need to be on your list. It's just mucking up when we have to report how many, I mean, we're always having to report how many sites and things that you guys have. And it's not accurate if we're just going off the number of approved applications. And so unless you have a, a, a you know, you know why they're inactive and you've got that documented, there's no reason to keep them on your list. And so I was talking to Karen about it and we're going to kind of implement some kind of process that she and I can do to, um, um, analyze those that are sitting there without any activity and 
reach out to you and if we have it documented why like say they're sick or say they take the summer off or whatever it is if there's a reason that's fine if not and it's just because you haven't dropped them we're going to drop them and we're also going to make sure that we're documenting in our system where they were at and that they just quit claiming because i i, I wonder maybe if some of you aren't dropping them because you don't want them to be able to go to some other sponsor and we can't let that happen so we just need to make sure you guys are removing them, sending them to us when, after they've gone three months of being inactive, get them off your list. Um, and we'll be the ones responsible for making sure they don't go to another sponsor. Clear as mud. Okay. So. The institution's application and agreement and budget are required uh, so that we, SCE and USDA, can ensure that each institution has financial viability, administrative capability, and program accountability. Um, so that's what your VCA stands for. You guys might not, might not have heard a lot about this VCA because um, most all of you guys have been on for many years and we really you should be demonstrating VCA every year so you should be demonstrating upon application renewal that you're all of these things we've just not done the best job on our end of collecting that information to ensure that so it's forcing us to have to look further into your financial information and forcing us to have to um, you know increase the amount of stuff we're asking for you during a review or on, on application renewal and um, our brand new entities are the ones filling the brunt of that because when you come on, it's a lot different now when any new institutions, whether it be a center um, or a new family daycare home sponsor, which like I said, we haven't even had anyone inquire about it in years. Um, there's a lot more to get on the program. USDA regulation um, requires that every institution has to comply with three, these three performance, and st performance standards. And like I said, on uh, every year on, a, on application renewal, you have to comply with them. So we've got some changes coming in the, in the new application to help start collecting that information. So first, what is what is financial viability? Um, it, it's showing that an institution must demonstrate that it has adequate finance, uh, financial resources to be able to operate the CACSD on a daily basis. And you know, you can do that for your, through your budget or management plan which you all have in the sponsor application. Um, and it's gotta be reasonable and necessarily in allowable cost, which we, uh, we're already doing that. We're looking at that upon application renewal and during reviews. Um, then you've gotta have adequate resources for your daily operations. Um, this is the hardest one that we, that, that we can <laughs> convey to all of our participants, especially right now, because things are hard for everyone. But, Every year you're, that you participate, you're agreeing and complying and assuring us that in the event we have any periods of program payment interruptions, or if you have to pay any money back because of a review, which isn't uncommon, you have other funds to do that. So I say this now, I'll probably say it again later. It's very likely that come tomorrow at 4.30, which is the end of our day, our claim system will be taken offline. We, we encounter this every year because um, we're always at USDA's mercy to provide the rates. <clears throat> we got the first set of rates out and there was a wrong rate. They just, the, the federal register just updated that and those came out yesterday, I think, with the corrected data. I think I saw it come across. But there's still the commodities rate, which um, doesn't really, it doesn't affect family daycare home payments at all. But it's we just have to take down all of our claims so that we can't risk having any claims whatsoever put in there when our rates aren't ready to be calculated and and make calculate payments. So I say that because, like I said, tomorrow it's very likely if we don't get that rate, when you go to our claim system, it'll just say this this site cannot be reached to to do that. You should be able to go ahead and make all your payments to your providers and pay your employees and all your other daily operations, you should have some other type of funding to cover those costs while we aren't able to pay you. And that's very hard, I know, especially for sponsors, um, because you're, 
you know, you are operating off the admin fees that we, we pay you, but you, you've got to have other supplemental income. And we are looking at that closely at, um, at, during reviews now. And we are going to be looking at it upon application renewal. Um, not, not as closely on that this year. We're working towards it because we're making some changes in the budget that we'll see in FY23. But um, just be expecting that in a review. So we, we got to see that, you know, we're looking at your, your banking information. You can't be in the negative. You guys already know that. Um, but you've also got to have some type of other funding, whether it's a line of credit, whether it's personal savings, which that's not what we want to have to happen. But you have to be able to show that you can operate without these funds. And that's pretty tough sometimes. Um, so anyway, administrative capability. So oh, that's, those are all cut off on my slides. So I just realized that. Okay. So you've got to have a correct staff and qualified number of staff. They got to be adequate. They've got to be trained. When it comes to the capability that this is talking about, do you have, are, are you trained your staff enough? Do they understand what the requirements are? Do you have adequate policies and procedures to be able to fulfill the program responsibilities and our civil rights requirements? So we are going to be looking closer at your policies and procedures. On the FY22 application that will come out at the end of next month, um, that very first form at the very top of your checklist that um, has historically only been like five questions, I think is grown to like 15 or more questions that are just asking things about how are you maintaining your records. And it's going to be repetitive of some of the things that are on your sponsor application already, but they're more specific. So um, be prepared for that. If you have questions about how to answer any of those questions, please reach out to me. But you guys should know, you guys have been doing this. You know what your policies are. You have good policies. And then program accountability. So that's just making sure you have adequate oversight um, to uh, basically your governing board. Um, you got to have your written fiscal accountability systems to ensure the integrity of all your funds. Um, you got to make sure that you're going to make one thing we're really having to make sure we can look at is that we can track the dollar. So when we pay you money into an account, if it's an account that's commingled with other funds, so say you're a multi, a multi agency institution, you're not just a family daycare home sponsor. If we're depositing funds into that account where there is other funds that are being deposited or being spent, there's expenses for things that are not related to this program, you have to have a very, um, very detailed way of accounting system to show that the money we pay you is only going back out um, for allowable costs for this program. So We've seen it, it, and that's more of our centers that have a hard time with that. Um, but it, is, it might really affect those of you that have um, multiple agencies within your institution. Like you might also be a child care and resource, child care resource and referral, or you might also be a community action. And we might be paying that same account that you get other funding that it goes into. Um, you don't have the detailed accounting, which I think you guys are all pretty you know, you do anyway, but if you don't, an easy solution for that is open a bank account just for the food program where those funds for this purpose only go to that account. Um, and we are looking at that much, much more closely during a review. So like I said, financial liability is probably the hardest one. You know, we can teach all of our participants the regulations and we can teach you how to keep records, but we cannot teach you how do not rely on this money to operate the program. So it is alarming to us when we have to shut down claims and we don't pay you for, it doesn't ever really last that long, but you will be surprised the amount of calls that we get of individuals, um, even that, I mean, centers, sponsors, even down to the providers calling us, being upset because they can't get a payment um, when you should all be able to operate without the funds when that happens. Another thing I didn't mention too, um, and it's one of the questions that will be on that application form that I mentioned. Um, in the event that you ever owe us money for a review, which like I said, isn't uncommon, it's not a big deal. Um, you can't,
can't use our funds, you can't use CACFP funds to pay a CACFP debt. And that's kind of confusing when usually when you guys owe money because of a review, we take it out of a claim. But we do, we're able to do that because, so say you owe money, we do the revision and then it comes out of your next payment, right? Um, you should have other supplemental in fund, uh, other supplemental funding income to cover that loss in that payment. So that's how we justify that. So one of the questions that you'll be asked in the new application is in the event that you owe money or that we have a lapse in payments, what other funding will you use? And it can't be CACFP funds. I just like to point that out. Okay, so eventually what the plan is, um, we are making changes to budgets, not so much to your the uh, sponsor family daycare home budgets, but what will be changing, and it won't hurt you guys near as much as it will our other institutions because you guys are sort of already doing this. You'll have to turn in um, an end of year report, which like I said, you guys are already doing this because of the 10% carryover business and we have how we have to uh, calculate that, but we will be creating a specific um, end of year report that you will have to do that, or if you have something better than that would be fine too. That is, that's going to be compared to your budget and it's gonna help us ensure that, you know, your expenditures are matching what you're being paid, essentially. Any questions on that? Okay. Um, so these are just some of the records that you have to complete or keep on file for financial, for financial requirements. That monthly personnel record worksheet, I, I think you all, you guys still do this. I don't know why we require this because you have to keep your personnel and the application and the budget up to date anyway. So come next year, we're not even gonna have that form. Um, you're welcome to use it if that's, if it's something good for your practice, but we're gonna take it out of the manual next year. It's not required. You guys are supposed to be keeping your personnel um, records. Everyone that's receiving any type of funds or has any type of duties should be reflected in your application anyway. So this is just a form we don't need. Every month you have to finish your worksheet, which you know records your uh, costs and it's gotta be supported by documentation, invoices, receipts, what have you. Um, edit checks. So you guys have to somehow prove you're doing edit checks on your claim. Um, many of you use Minute Menu, Minute Menu or Kid Care or whatever it's called now. Um, if not, you're manually going through and checking all the claims to make sure meal patterns are met and attendance and all that. Um, but you really have to have a good method to show us that's happening. Especially, well, even so, even when you're doing Minute Menu, it prints out those office error reports. You still got to show you're going back and making sure they're legitimate errors. Um, we're really, in the reviews I've been involved in this year, we're not seeing that being done as um, efficiently as it needs to be. You guys really are gonna have to hone in on making sure you're not paying them for meals they're not entitled to. And I know that's tough right now because, you know, folks are hurting for any funding they can get. And it would be unfortunate that we can't pay them for a meal that they've already provided, but if it didn't meet meal patterns, we can't. Uh, okay, you got to keep your uh, provider and claim document, claim for reimbursement, you have to keep those on file. Payment notices, um, we do ask, it is a question in the administrative review. You don't have to print those every, every month though. They're there at your fingertips. We upload them in the claims for you. Way back a long time ago, they were mailed and it was like if you ever lost it, they could never be regenerated and so you had to make sure you didn't lose them. They're always there, so that's not a big deal. And then you also have to have your payment vouchers and disbursement records in that, you know, it's just for record keeping purposes. But we also look at those to make sure that you're paying your providers within five days of receiving the money. So some other required documents are your building for the future. Um, your WIC brochure, if you guys are in need, the Building for the Future is on the resource library. If you guys need a, any new WIC brochures, um, let us know. We'll send you some. 
You also have to have an annual organizational wide audit. And then I just kind of dumped this one in here because I didn't want to forget about it. But um, let me back up. On the annual organization wide audit, that's only for institutions that uh, expend $750,000 or more in federal funds. But I think most of you guys get some type of audit. And when we refer to audit, that's not the one we do. We're talking about like an outside financial audit. So the mealtime change form is something new. It, I think I put it on the resource library. If not, it was in the handouts I sent you. We're not gonna, you can start using this form right away. I would suggest it, but it's really gonna be a form required um, for this coming year. There were several of you that we had to contact to get your help because we had an audit finding. So to explain a little bit, you know, no system is perfect. And this system has been flawed and our CCSC system has been flawed since it came out for, you know, some different things. As you know, you can go in there and change meal times and you don't have to resubmit the application. It'll let you say, well, and it is automatically approved. Um, we're not going to change that for you guys because that would just be way too cumbersome. You know, you should be able to go in there and update your meal times for your providers when you need with without our approval. But we need it documented what the change was. So what our we had a state audit and what the finding was. We had a provider say in October, November, December, they were claiming supper, right? So then for whatever reason they decided to quit doing supper. You went in there and changed it and removed the supper time. Well, now our auditors are looking at our claim data and they're looking at the current application for that time, which has no supper meal, yet we paid them for a supper. So now it looks like we've paid a provider for a meal they never had an approved time. Our system doesn't even maintain that history. Um, it knows a change was made, but it has no idea what the change was. It doesn't know when the supper was there. It doesn't know what time the supper was. And so luckily, and I, I commend all of you that um, we had to reach out to, there were a handful of you that we had to, and it, we were like, we need this like yesterday when we reached out to you. Um, we were like, we need some kind of documentation that you can send us that proves you didn't pay this meal without them being approved that meal time. And every single one of you had it for every single provider. And we were able to get that, that finding resolved before it was an official, the, the, the audit was over. So it was removed. So like I said, I commend you all for having such good record keeping um, that we were able to do that. But it was kind of a hassle because we were having to come up with different ways to figure out how to do that. So because of that, we are now, we've now created our own mealtime change form. And it's a whole lot crammed onto one page. I'll give you that. But it's something that we have to be able to record what the time was and what it's being changed to because we have no other way to track that. So it's going to be uh, your responsibility that every time a provider wants to make a change to their meal times that you have this form on file. You don't need to send them to us. You don't need our approval. You just need to have them fill it out and keep it in their file because it's going to happen again. It's gonna come up in an audit again until we find a way to fix this in our system. And right now we just don't know how, because once you change that meal time, it's gone. If you wanna create your own form, it needs to be like anything else, better, you know, better than, equal to or better than. Um, but like I said, there's an awful lot crammed on that one page. So it's probably to be in your best interest just to use that form and go with it. I know it's just one extra thing for you guys to do, but like I said, it's nothing you have to send in to us or we have to approve. Just make sure you please have it on file. With that said, going forward, if it is found in an audit in the future, um, we've implemented this um, solution. If you don't have the form and you don't have the documentation that shows that they really should they be paid for those meals, it's going to be on on, it'll be your responsibility at that point. Now you've paid someone without the documentation. So it's just really that important that we uh, are using the form. Any questions on it? Yeah, but in minute menu, 
does it track? I can't remember. It's been so long since I've been on your side of things. Once you change it in minute menu, it's gone too, right? Is there a way, does it track when they were changed? Can anybody speak to that? You can pull an end of the month um, change report and it'll tell you what the meal time was and what you changed it to. Um, and it'll do that for all the changes you made at minute menu. That's right, I remember that. But then you would still have to know when it happened. It gives you the date of when it happened, um, what the what it, it was before and then what you changed it to it so it's pretty specific um yeah but yeah i get it if you um so if you have a minute menu it has a way to pull a report and i remember that now thank you Jalen. um it's a it's a it's just any changes that you made on a provider right it's any changes you made you can pull it monthly and yeah any changes that you made a minute menu as far as you know um a last name change or email whatever can you can you pull one of those when you have a chance not today um just whenever you can what is the name of that report in minute menu they're asking um, one second let me go because i could look at it and if it's got it you know if it's got all the information i'll have to make sure i'll get with jennifer and make sure that would be an, a suitable you know, in lieu of this form. We'll get that information. I think it's just like provider change something. I don't know. Yeah, it's that. provider. Okay, yeah. Go to providers and then provider, provider file changes report, and then you can customize it to which month. So it'll go back, you know, three or four months if you need it to. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah, just pull one and email it to me. And, um, We'll see if that wouldn't suffice for those of you using a minute menu and we'll go from yeah, there. Yeah, I can continue. Okay, we just gotta do something. Like I said, you guys were awesome and, and we had something, but some of them we were just using, luckily you guys were doing contract renewals. There were some of them that had that contract renewal. So anyway, we gotta implement something. It's not just you, it, it is all of our institutions. So. Our centers are not going to be happy with this either because now they have to send them in to us and they're not going to like that, but it is what it is. Okay, so you guys have to also develop policies. You know that providers must receive a copy of these policies during the pre-approval pre visit. And there are certain policies and procedures you have to have um, and they have to be informed of. We have examples of all those on, on um, the resource library. There is no restriction on the days of operation um, a sponsor can operate, but we have to know, like we have to approve it first. So like if you're only gonna be open in your office Monday through Thursday, that's fine. It needs to be on um, your business maintenance page or application and it has to be approved by us just so that we know, we know when to be there and what not to be when we need to do a review. But whatever time, your hours of operation, your days of operation are, you have to be available. Um, and if you're not gonna be, you gotta let us know. And I know for some of you that's tough because you might be just a one or two man show and you gotta go do monitoring reviews. Um, so you're not always gonna be there at your office. And I think you all have pretty much worked out with your consultants, you know, a, a way to communicate that. So, you know, we just gotta make sure that if we show up at your, where your, where your files are that you will be there or can be there very soon to let us end a thing. You all know that though. So some of the other things, other requirements, um, and we'll, we'll we go over everything, I think a billion times in this training, but um, civil rights compliance, and then all your record provider record keeping, enrollment forms, daily arrival and departure, uh, meal served, infant and regular um, your cycle menu, which we'll talk a little more about later when we get into the um, meal patterns. Uh, but cycle menus are still optional. My, my opinion is highly rec recommended, but they are optional. And you guys, we got to make sure we're keeping CN labels and that crediting information on those types of products. We're seeing a lack in that. Um, and then we'll talk about recruitment as well. Right here, we'll talk about it. So a sponsor cannot use its own money for rewards or incentives to try to bring on new providers. 
you know, you can't say that you'll pay them more or tell them you're going to do anything differently than any, any other SO. Um, you can't tell them that they don't have to go to training. You, you can't do their paperwork for them, make that an incentive. Um, there's all kinds of different things. Thank you, Jalen. She told you guys exactly those of you on Minute Menu. She put it in there exactly how to find that. There are a lot of examples that we hear providers or sponsors calling and saying they've heard another one instead. And sometimes, you know, I know they may not always, providers say things on us that aren't always true anyway, but you guys know you can't use incentives to try to lure your providers away from another. If you're doing any type of outreach, you just um, call them and say, hey, are you with the program? And if they say yes, then just say thank you. And that's the end of the conversation. Expansion funds. So I don't not I think we went over it last year, maybe for one of the first times. Um, it's not anything we've ever really trained on. Um, but where there are expansion funds available every year that you can apply for. And it's just assistance made available um, to you guys that if you want to expand into an area, a low income or rural area that that is needs, you know, a program. Um, it's really hard right now because COVID's just really taken a toll on every everything. Numbers have dropped. Um, and right now it's kind of a moot point because we have the eligibility waiver. So everybody qualifies. Uh, so if you're interested in expansion funds, so I mean, um, I, we're working on a new application that it will be give you more information that will require more information for you to provide Basically, you have to find an area that you see the need. It has to be in a low income um, rural area because that's the purpose of this program really is to focus on the, the children that need, you know, need the help with, or the providers that have the children that need more nutrition meals, nutritious meals and what where they, that's needed anyway. That's the point of these expansion funds to help you go there. Um, it's not to help you make up for shortcomings um, if you know you you budget every year on a certain number and that's what your goal is you really need to operate if you if you budget on a certain number of providers your goal is to stay at that number of providers but if you lose a bunch of providers your expansion funds is not for making up that loss of revenue expansion funds is to grow above and beyond what you already are in a new area so i guess a new application is coming um hopefully for the new year we'll have that but i just I can't see, um, I don't know, I shouldn't say that, that we wouldn't have any that would be approved for it. But right now everyone's expanding to where your tier two ones are because of the area eligibility waiver. But you'll apply for it, you get a certain amount. Um, I should have had it right here in front of me. I think it's for 50 or 100 providers. Somebody who knows, tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> but it's the um, home times rate, I think it's for 100 whatever that amount is, and that's the maximum. Um, but you have to show how you're going to spend it. You're going to spend it um, on salaries. You're going to spend it on materials, mileage, what have you. You're going to have to tell us your plan and show documentation for how you plan to expand to those areas. You have to actually give a list um, of the areas and of those providers who aren't currently served by any sponsors. So that will require you to like pull a DHS list and compare it to our system to make sure they're not with someone. It's a lot of work. And then if you are granted the funds, you have a certain, um, a very short time to spend it. And then afterwards you have to submit that documentation into us to show us what you spend it on. And in the event that you don't spend it all, you have to pay it back. So it's a very short span um, that all that happens. I think the max, it has to be done. You have to spend it within eight weeks. So anyway, um, we have a new application that's gonna be coming out and we can learn more about it then. If you have questions, though, just let me know. But I think it's not the current application is on a resource library. Uh, okay, personnel policies. You guys all know you have to have your personnel policies um, as well as your provider policies. Um, if you have any changes to either of those policies, please send a copy to us because they do have to be approved um, and they have to be uploaded. Um, and these are the different things that you have to um, discuss in your personnel policies. Hiring procedures, uh, you got to list the types of positions, an organizational chart, your schedules, all these things listed here you have to have a policy on. Um, 
you know, these are these policies aren't just suggestions, they're required. So you've got to make sure you have policies on for both your personnel and your providers and the topics we give you, they're regulatory. So if you're missing something that you see on the screen, either for your personnel or your providers, you don't have a policy on that, go to the resource library and look at our examples. We have to have policies on all of these things. And I'll say it again, I'm sure in a little bit, but it did, it does mention um, cycle menus if applicable. Oops, I keep doing that. If applicable, um, they're not required, but it is, it is your responsibility to make that decision. We had some confusion in the beginning when we first realized cycle menus weren't required and it kind of blew everyone's mind because we all thought they were required and they're not. Um, and sponsors just kind of left it up to the providers and that sort of created a, um, a mess. So as a sponsor, you have to decide, yes, we will have cycle menus or no, we're not gonna do them. And if you're not gonna do them, don't have any. But if you are, you gotta make sure they're approved and you know they are have all creditable foods just like you were used to in the past. We don't care how many days they are, it's just got to have meals on it that meet um, meal patterns, obviously. Um, we'll go over the SD stuff again later, but um, we do have all the prototype letters for SD notices um, and all that process in the resource library. Anytime you have an SD provider, before a letter goes out, you have to send it in for approval. We have to make sure that you're using the right letter. It's got the right verbiage. We did have um, a finding on this from a USDA management evaluation a few years ago. So we have to make sure that we're following these very specific policies on um, serious deficiencies. And then you have to have appeal procedures. And they have to be, they basically just have to be the ones we have posted in the resource library. Um, you can't add to or take away from it. They're regulatory. So if you don't have those available, go grab them off resource library and you have to provide them to your providers every year. Okay, so determining your staffing needs, there's no certain required staff positions um, nor required types of positions that must be filled to supervise the CACFP, but except for monitors. We don't care what you call yourself or your staff. What we care about is that all the duties that are required administratively um, are covered. So that's why we have to have those job descriptions because everyone calls themselves, there's different names for you know, different positions and depending on what organization, but we have to know who has what duties. But most importantly, we have to make sure we have enough monitors to take care of all the homes um, in which you sponsor. Uh, your geographic boundaries and other services that you may offer, you gotta make sure that you have, and it's on that page too, it's broken up for you and it tells you exactly how many you need to have um, of rural and metropolitan areas. And make sure when you have those monitors listed, those people are actually the ones doing the on-site monitoring because we will be looking, the monitors you have listed, we will, we will be looking to see that they are actually doing monitoring reviews. Um, but in addition to those, you gotta have adequate staff to perform all those other regulatory duties, um, pre-approval visits, technical assistance, uh, reading cycle menus and approving them if you do them, editing claims, processing payments, uh, financial record keeping, training, what have you. So really this, like I said, the bottom line is that you should have adequate staff to perform all those duties in CECFP. And if you have any questions on what those are or what those examples should be, uh, look, look to the manual because we have all that in there. Okay, civil rights. You gotta have the poster displayed um, in your office. It's not required in homes. I know some of you do have, do require it in your homes and that's fine, but we don't look for it when we're out there because it's not required but it's got to be in your office. If you don't have the green one, that's the right one. You need to let us know and we'll send it to you. Um, and remember civil rights training is required every year and this training does not cover that. So it is a self-paced training that we have um, and it's offered, it's, I think you can take it any time of the year. We update it every year. So if you don't if you know how to get on there, 
email me. I'll send you to who needs to help you get registered for it. Or it's just, you can go into our training calendar just like you registered for this training, but you have to take that every year. Everyone that has anything to do with your CSFC has to take that training. Okay, and then here's the non-discrimination statement. As you know, you've got to put this on all your information. Um, but at the very least, if you can't fit that big statement, um, all your information needs to inform public, the public about this program. It's got to contain that statement. If not, it can be shortened to this. But the font size of this statement can't be any smaller than the smallest text in the, the um, document you send out. Clear as mud. Okay, so the public information notification responsibility includes informing all eligible persons of the availability of the program, as well as their the rights and responsibilities. Um, applicants and participants must also be advised of their right to file a complaint, how to file and pro procedures to do so. And I know you all know this, um, but it is one thing that we look at during an administrative review. Do you have the complaint form on file? And many times, um, you, you guys don't. So in your packet of forms, that's one of the things in there. If you don't have that readily available, just make a folder and just stick it somewhere so that when we come in and say, hey, do you have your complaint form on file? You can be like, yep, I got it right here. I can't say that we've gotten any, not since I've been in the office from Family Day Care Homes, but it happens. And you've got to have that on file if, if we have a civil rights complaint. So let's see. Um, there is another handout that you have. It's several pages long. It's a, um, a memo that what this is about. So basically, they took away back in, I think it was November is when the memo came out. At, we, we, prior to that, could do visual observation to collect um, race and ethnicity on the children when we're conducting reviews um, or even when they're reporting it to us or to you guys. And USDA has said in that memo that's not an acceptable way to collect that, which I get it. And I've, I've said this half a dozen times to the people in my office. If you've ever seen my child, he's blonde hair and blue eyed. And you would say, that is a white, a Caucasian child through and through. But when I fill out his information, he's Asian. His dad's Japanese. You would never guess that when you look at my child. Um, so he would be every time miscategorized. So I totally can understand why, and, and I'm glad that, that visual observation isn't an option anymore because it's not an accurate way to collect data. So it really kind of puts the burden back onto our participants to collect that when we can't visually observe. So um, we've taken all the reference to visual observation. It's going to come off the application, um, and that memo is there for you to reference. Um, so make sure if you have anything about how we're collecting race and ethnicity, you also take it off about visual observation. Um, USDA is highly recommending, and I think it says it in that memo, that self-identification and self-reporting is really what they want, because that's obviously the most accurate way we can collect that from the individual. Um, we're making some changes to the applications to be able to accommodate the fact that um, Many more, you, uh, more times than not, you've got children now that are more than one race. And if you've been responsible for entering the applications, the information in our application, it wouldn't, it wouldn't allow you to have, you have to choose which race that child is if they mark more than one. So we're making changes in the system now to where when you're reporting those numbers of race and, race and ethnicity, those numbers don't have to match because it asks if they, whether they're Hispanic or not, and so every child is either going to be yes or no. You can't be both on that one. But then we have the five categories of race. And our system forces it to those two numbers to match. It also forces it to match your, match your enrollment. And when that happens, you can only assign one race per child. And that is just not realistic. It's not adequate dat data. So we're, we've changed that to where they can report, they can check all five of them if, if it's applicable. But it's also put another um, burden on, on you all and, and your providers because it's something not on the enrollment form. The only place we collect 
race and ethnicity right now is on the income application. And not everybody fills out the income application. If it's a provider who qualifies by school and they don't have children that they would otherwise want to um, claim of their own, they would never see the income application. And that's the only place that we're collecting it. So I'm going to update the enrollment form. Right now, the enrollment form you guys have um, in the manual doesn't have a place to um, choose, choose those ethnic, race and ethnic choices. But I'm going to update it and send it out to you guys. Um, I'll try to get it done this evening, but I can't promise that. <clears throat> so at least you have something to start collecting it on, um, but it's still optional. So, okay, so you guys added it to your enrollment forms, great. If you have your own enrollment form and you wanna add it on there, do that because we can't, like I said, we can't do the visual observation anymore. So the provider needs to have some way to let the parents report it, but the parents can still choose not to report it. We cannot force them to um, self-report if they don't want to, and that's fine. But now that we've made those changes in the system where the number of children with race doesn't have to match enrollment, that won't be a problem. I can remember being so frustrated with that. And like I said, for those of you that do the application know exactly what I'm talking about. You know, you have one child and you've got two or three races selected, but the system won't allow you to do that because it exceeds your enrollment. Then you have to choose which race they are. And that's just not okay either. So I say all that to say, Add it to your enrollment. If you have your own separate, separate enrollment, I'm going to add it to the one that um, is currently in the manual and send it out to you guys since we're a little late on that. Because USDA, when they sent this out in November, basically they were just like, here it is, we're taking it away, we'll send further guidance, and no further guidance has come. So we've just kind of taken it upon ourselves to figure out a plan. So that's our plan. Any questions on that? Procurement procedures and practices. Um, the last couple of years, we've just really pounded on procurement. We're, there's several slides here, and we'll talk about it. Most of these procurement procedures and practices do not apply to you guys. Um, most of you, you get your payments, you pay for your salaries, you buy the supplies you need, you try to get the biggest bang for your buck, and that's exactly what USDA wants us to do but you still have to have procedures and practices written plans in place in the event that you know you needed to buy or make other larger purchases we have a procurement plan prototype in the resource library you should all already have that but if you don't go grab it and just fill it out and put rainbow uh, what it, sorry i don't know why i said rainbow leaf um but i just say that because i recently was there but whatever your name is there's places to fill it out if you are Rainbow Fleet, say this is Rainbow Fleet, it's a title, your procurement um, plan. I should have pulled it up, or I should have put it in your handouts, but um, there's lots of little places to fill in what your practices are, and it spells it out exactly for you what you have to have. So if you don't have one, adopt that one until you can create your own or just use ours. It's the easiest thing to do. Because like I said, most of you are just going to be doing micro purchasing, which we'll talk about. Um, there's informal methods and formal methods. Informal is micro purchasing and small purchase. And then our formal methods, which I really don't think any of you guys are using us or other larger ones that are multi agency institutions, you're still bid competitive and non competitive proposals. Micro purchasing, like I said, is what you guys are using. Um, you don't have to get any quotes, you just have to have pre reasonable prices. You just have to show that you're spreading the wealth unless there's not any reasonable way to do that. Meaning you're not always going to one supplier. You're not always going to Walmart to buy it. But if Walmart's the only place you have to shop and the next store is like 50 miles away, it's not reasonable to go to a different store than just to go to the Walmart in your town. That's fine. Um, as long as you're not spending more um, than $10,000 per transaction, you're going to be using micro purchase. And as long as you're just trying to get reasonable prices and spread the wealth, you're good. Um, the other one that you guys might be using is small purchase procedures, which, but I doubt because I don't think many of you are having any purchases over $10,000 at a time. Um, but for small purchases procedures apply to purchases made. Any, any one transaction that's in between 10,000, that's over $10,000 and under $250,000. Um, 
per bid or solicitation or transaction. You do have to obtain quotes on these. It can either be by mail, phone, um, oral, what have you. Just showing that you shopped around and it has to be at least two sources. Um, and then, like I said, I'm really not going to go over these formal ones because I don't know, I don't know any of you that are using formal um, procurement methods, but your bids, they have to be publicly solicited and you have to go to at least two vend vendors. Um, just like with anything, you've got to have include complete, adequate, and realistic specifications so they know what they're bidding on. And bids may be rejected for sound documented reason. Okay, non-competitive proposals, that would be when there's no other form of procurement, it's feasible, you only have, there's a documented reason why um, you're going to use, you're, you're going to use, hold on a second, sorry, I have seen issues. So, non-competitive proposals may be used when um, award of a contract is not feasible um, under the small purchase procedures, build bids, or other competitive proposals, and at least one of the following circumstances must apply. So the item is available from only one single source. You can't find that anywhere else, and that's the only place you can get it. Um, or emergency circumstances will not permit um, or a delay in the competitive solicitation, or competition is determined to be inadequate after solicitation of a number of other sources. So, like I said, I keep going back to the fact that you guys are using one of these two things. And most of you, it's just going to be micro-purchasing. But how do you know? What's the difference? I guess micro-purchasing, you, um, everything you're, you're buying is coming from multiple stores, Walmart, Crest, Restaurant Depot, what have you. You're not purchasing from a vendor. You're not having to check prices. You're just buying from multiple sources and you're staying under $10,000. If that's how you purchase, that's that, that is your main source of procurement. Like I said, you still have to have policies on all the other ones. So just go grab that template off our resource library and make it yours. Um, but it's small purchase. How do you know if you're doing small purchase? Um, that's if you're checking prices. Even if it's on a $5 item like this says, um, if you're checking prices to try to get a bigger bang for your buck, then you're doing small purchase, even though you've not gone over that $10,000 threshold. But when you're checking prices, you got to at least document you're getting it from two different sources. I mean, you don't always have to go with the lowest, the lowest vendor or the lowest store, because like I said, you might have a reason for going to a different one that's a higher price because you don't have to drive to the next town to get it or what have you. Any questions on procurement? These are all the things that your procurement plan and procedures must include. Um, and this is all regulatory, but if you go and grab that off resource library and put your name in all the spaces, you will be covered. Somebody needs to mute. All right, so what are not allowable procurement practices? These are, these are just some of the things that are not acceptable when you're procuring or um, purchasing your item. It is, it is not inclusive, but all inclusive, but this is just some of the things. Um, potential contractor writing big bid proposals. So the potential person doing the work can't write the bid or proposal for you or evaluate the bid or proposal submitted by competitors. Um, you can't negotiate field bid awards. Um, potential contractors cannot have access to field bids prior to opening and purchases without following procurement procedures. So you have to have procedures and you have to follow them. Okay. So your sponsoring organization budget. You have to submit an administrative budget uh, every year. You guys know that. And it's to document your administrative earnings and expenses. And the budget has got to include sufficient detail for us to be able to determine whether the expenditures are allowable, necessary, and reasonable. Um, we will be gradually asking for more documentation upon application renewal, like I said before, to um, 
verify and validate some of these costs. So uh, you guys are used to that. Anyway, we're pretty good with, we've been, we've been doing that with you guys already. It's a little different with family daycare homes, mostly because you all have that, um, have to report your end of year stuff anyways because of the 10% carryover. But in order for um, a cost to be allowable um, or to be necessary for the performance or administration, in order for the cost to be allowable, a cost must be necessary for the performance or administration of funds uh, provided by FNS. A cost is necessary if it is required for the institution to operate the program and meet regulations. Costs are reasonable when it reflects what um, sensible and practical person would pay in the same situation. Necessity is determined by the nature of the activity, while re reasonableness is determined by the amount of cost. Remember that all costs cost charged to CACFP must be properly documented with receipts, invoices, uh, mileage logs, time and attendance records. Um, payments must be documented with bank statements, registers, or your accounting system. And all of your, your costs require prior approval before they can be incurred. Costs may be direct costs if they're easily to identify um, as directly attributable to the CACFP. But so some examples of those would be your salaries, um, those who solely work for the CACFP, your cost of materials used specifically for the operation of CACFP, trial expenses like uh, monitoring reviews, pre-approval visits. Those are costs that are just solely directly to for CACFP. But then you might have other indirect costs. And those are difficult to be able to distinguish because, um, especially if I have a multi-agency uh, institution, I mean, you have to have a way or apply an indirect cost rate to determine how much of that cost um, you can charge off to CACFP. So a good example of that would be like your water and utilities. Um, like in our school systems, it's easier for them because in their cafeterias, they sometimes will have a separate water meter and a separate, you know, electricity meter but you guys aren't gonna have that. So if you operate out of your home or if you operate out of a building that you have other programs in, you have to have a methodology for what percentage of those costs will you use CACFP funds to pay for. And generally the easiest way to do that is based off square footage. And I think you guys all know that unless you have some other type of indirect cost rate to apply, but it's gotta be reasonable. Um, so if you need help with that or have questions on it, we're always here to help you with it. But like I said, if you don't have one and you're just second guessing it, you're, um, the easiest way is to go with square footage and, and figure it out that way. <clears throat> Allocation is a procedure used to determine the amount or percentage of cost charged to a particular function um, or activity or program. Um, so that only the share of the cost that benefits CACFP can be considered a program cost. So in other words, you're, you're able to determine the proportion of the cost that is applicable to CACFP, pretty much just what I said. Um, all expenses claimed by the institution require written, written approval prior to expenditure. Um, also, all expenses must be charged off in the month in which they are incurred. So like your mileage, um, although, you know, some of it's kind of retroactive, you're not going to pay your mileage until the following month because it's not done, um, but it needs to be charged back and um, allocated to the correct month in which it was spent. This is not an all-inclusive list either, but it's an example of unallowable cost, um, anything that's not reasonable or necessary, something that's not approved on the budget. Um, something that wasn't properly allocated between your CACFP and non-CACFP programs, and transactions that are less than arm's length. So, you know, you can't just hire someone that, to do work for you that's your, you know, brother's company just because that's easy to have them come in and do whatever. That was a poor example, but you know what I mean. You can't buy alcohol. You can't lobby with our funds. Um, you can't contract. Oops. Sorry. Contract with SO employees, officers, or board members. Can't use the money as um, recruitment incentive. Now you can use it for not incentives, but you can use it for training um, materials and things like that for existing providers. 
And I mentioned this earlier, you can't use this to pay bad, you can't use these funds to pay bad debts. Even um, other bad debts, not just CHFP, these funds should not be used to pay bad debts. Allowable practices would be purchases made for individuals through the CHFP account. CHFP vendor services billed to an individual instead of the SO or personal credit card or checks for CHFP purchases. That last one's the one we see the most of. Um, you, you can't go out and make purchases with your personal credit card and then reimburse yourself for it. Um, it really should be on a company related credit card. Sorry, there goes my dog barking. Okay, all labor documentation must include the number of hours worked each day, starting and ending times, and any ab absences. Um, time in and time out sheets are required on all sponsor employees. So if you're using these funds to pay someone, you have to have a time in and time out sheet. Salary for individual employees must not exceed the labor um, approved labor formula for that employee. That's the one that's in the system on the um, salary tab. Hold on a second, guys. Sorry. Okay, and so in your handout, you should have the um, conference, I don't know what we call it, conference trip calculator, what have you. Um, that's an example of one of those, um, I should have mentioned that earlier, but you gotta have that approval for any travel beforehand. Some of you filled that out because you were gonna travel and stay overnight and be here today, but we had to cancel that, so sorry guys. If you have any questions on that form, just let us know, but it's just an estimate. So that's one, one example. Um, other things we have to approve at a time would be like, uh, and y'all are used to this, like any large equipment, we need to approve those equipment over a certain dollar amount, but then your travel has to be approved. Any travel that's not program related. Well, it's all program related, but I mean like you're monitoring and all that, that's not what we're talking about. But if you're doing travel for like conferences or to our trainings, you have to fill out that calculator and send it to us with your estimate. And then afterwards, um, you will submit it with receipts and the official amount, and then we'll get it entered in your budget. Okay, budget amendments, you guys are all familiar with this. We have a form and it should be in your handouts as well that you have to complete for any time you need to amend your budget. Um, we don't, contrary to what we've ever been told, there is no limit on the number of revisions of anything we can do. There's only a limit, a time limit on when we can make revisions to a budget or a claim. Um, revising or amending your budget uh, per USDA guidelines for management plans and and budgets, like I said, you can at any point after the budget is approved, you can amend it. Um, but you must submit revisions or those amendments to the budget to us for approval. And that's what that form is for. Any budget revisions or amendments should be sent to Karen now and she'll approve those. Um, an organization is prohibited from spending CACFP funds in accordance with the amended budget until the amendments have been reviewed and approved by a state agency. So. You can't, you can't spend those funds on a, that you wanna revise until Karen's approved it basically. Cost increase submitted in a budget amendment are not allowable program, are not allowable program costs until the amendment is approved. Um, so here's an example of, that require a submission of a revised budget. So you need to make changes to salary or benefits, um, equipment, travel, consultant, or contract services. Uh, line item increases or decreases for any dollar amount on any of your line items, um, or when like your participation increases or decreases, um, you need to change your number of homes you could space upon. You also need to update it when the number of your facilities changes. And so that's, that's continually updated as you're adding and removing providers as well. One thing I like to point out though, when you have salary um, employee changes, make sure you don't remove the person that was there for the portion of the year. So say you had um, a coordinator, a monitor, whatever you call them, and they were there for October through February, and then they left. Don't take them off your budget. 
um, you want to revise it and put the full amount of what they were paid for that, you know, the entire time they were there, but leave them there because that was still an expense. Um, but don't just remove them altogether. Okay. Other required forms, I just went on about the budget justification. We have uh, the claim uh, revision form. Nothing's changed about that. Uh, you'll have to fill that out and email it to Karen so she can add the adjustment. And I said that before. I, I, in the past, we were kind of led to believe we could, uh, we could only do one revision. We don't, we really don't want you to do a lot of revisions because that's usually indicative of something like maybe going on. Someone has a question. Oh, yeah. Equipment will also need receipts. Good point. There's a lot of things on your on your budget that we'll ask receipt, receipts for. And when you do any type of, are you talking about when you're doing a budget adjustment to get new equipment? We'll need to see quotes. Is that what you're saying, Karen? Sorry. Okay, yeah. Anytime you want to add the equipment and, and you're doing a budget adjustment, it has to be supported with um, supporting documentation. Typically, we'll ask for supporting documentation on, on a lot of things. So back to your claims revision, nothing's changed about that. You've got to email it to Karen so she can open it up for you. Um, and then you go in there and adjust your claim. Um, we're doing what's called claim validations now. And I think there was two of you selected this last year. And really, it's just like a little mini, mini review that we're conducting um, in the office. We're having to do that because the state auditors want to know how we're assessing risk. So we've developed this tool for how we can um, evaluate the risk of claims. And there's all these different indicators like where you, how many revisions have you had? Um, how many days of the month, like our, our, our and I'm gonna to speak to providers, but we're doing it on all types of institutions, so it's even centers, but did your providers claim every day of the month? Did they claim the maximum capacity for every meal? Um, block claiming, basically. And I'm saying all that to say that one of those risk indicators is if you have lots of revisions, like why, why are we having so many revisions? And as I've gotten to talk to people about it, a lot of times we've got revisions and it's not because you've made an error. More times than not, you guys are doing revisions because you have a late provider, which is okay, but you really got, you need to start kind of calling these people's bluff. Like they need to have their claim in on time. And I would highly suggest instead of you submitting, I mean, used to, if you remember, and I, I, that was before it went, on, it went online and we got paid every week. Like if you had a revision, it had to wait till the next month. Like these, these providers have got spoiled and they're just used to being paid. So they'll turn it in whenever they want um, and we'll, then we'll just pay it. So I just, I really think you need to encourage them to turn their claims in on time. And if they don't, you do not have to pay it. And I'm not saying that's a good thing to do. You don't wanna just not pay them. They need to know that that can happen because now you're jeopardizing that being a risk indicator um, for them being laid off on their claim. You need to hold on to it and make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. Anyway, I digress. So when we have a conference and work, I already talked about that one, a conference and work, workshop trip cal calculator. We already talked about the meal time change form. Um, monthly personnel record worksheet, like I said, you can do that one now if you want or not. We're really going to just do away with that form altogether next year because it's so, a moot point. You have to keep up with your expenditure worksheet. It's a summary of your reports of all allowable CACFC administrative costs that incurred during the month. If you have some other type of way that your, um, your accounting method that um, is as good as or better than our expenditure worksheet, you don't have to do the expenditure worksheet, but you have to document all your administrative or cost, administrative costs. Um, and they have to be supported by your receipts, invoice, payroll records, canceled checks, things like that. And they, you know, all your costs have, that are reported have to be approved on your budget. So if we come out and do an administrative review and you've got an expenditure worksheet or um, detailed report or whatever, however you do your accounting method that shows all your costs and we're comparing it back to your budget, if it's not approved on your budget, we'll have to back it out as one of your costs because you can't spend it on unapproved um, costs. 
So let's see, I'm not gonna go over how to fill them out. You guys know how to do that. And plus, I think we have another slide that goes over send it to worksheet. Your payment notices already mentioned that. You really don't have to print those anymore. They're at your fingertips at any time, um, but you can if you want and just keep it with your claim documentation. And then you have your payment voucher disbursement records. Um, we already talked about that. It has to show the provider's name, mailing address, agreement, and number. There are certain things that have to be on it. Um, some of you use our actual disbursement records that's in the manual. And some of you have Minute Menu or whatever other type of system, if your accounting system that uh, prints the checks on the stubs has all the required documentation, you don't have to necessarily use our disbursement rec record form as long as it has all the information that's on it or that's required. And like I said, that's your, the name, their address, their agreement, the month and year of the claim, the day it was paid, a check number, and then the reimbursement due. Okay, claim submissions and claim re review procedures. Every month, edit checks have to be performed on every claim you pay. You guys know that. You have to verify all the, the things listed on this slide that you see, in addition to ensuring that menus meet meal patterns and that attendance records support the, the meals that are claimed, excuse me, and also that enrollment data supports the attendance. If not, you should not pay that meal. And we're just, and I, I mentioned that earlier, that's one thing we're finding that um, sponsors are falling a little short on. I don't know, I mean, if things are tough, like I said, I know, and we wanna to try to give all our providers as much as we can, but we can't pay them for meals that are not creditable. And so we've gotta do our due diligence that when we're editing claims, that we're making sure that, for, you know, their tier status is correct, um, that their enrollment data is, is reflected in their attendance data, you got to make sure that their attendance, if your kids claimed for a meal, you got to make sure they're in attendance. And sometimes that's going to be so tedious because if all your, um, if you do all handwritten claims, you don't have an automated system, it's going to take time. But you really should be checking every arrival and departure and every meal time to make sure a child's not claimed when they're not there. And we are seeing, we've seen that error um, on several reviews. Um, and then meal patterns. We're, we're going to talk a little more later about meal patterns, but we've, we have some issues with meal patterns, um, meals being allowed and paid for when they don't meet meal patterns. And I'm not sure if that's, uh, you know, we need to do some training on it and be clear about what's creditable and what's not, especially when it comes to meat and combination items, and we'll talk about that. But we also, um, I forgot what I was going to say. Sorry, guys. Oh, also, I think it's just a lack of providers kind of being lazy and not recording things as detailed as, as they as detailed as they need to be. So we've just got to make sure that we're meeting all these things before we pay it, because unfortunately, it's going to result in you guys having to pay money back. Um, when submitting your claim in our system, beginning October 1, you will be required to record the enrollment number for each provider claim. That was another thing that kind of, it actually was something I found when I was doing those claim validations that I was talking about earlier, because that was one of the things I was looking at. So like, how many do you have enrolled and how many is your average daily participation or average daily attendance is what we call it in CACSD. Your average daily attendance is just taking um, your days of operation and comparing it to your number enrolled and it's telling you this is the average number claimed every day of children. And I was looking to see if those things exceeded the enrollment. Well, I found instances where enrollment was listed as zero on that application for participation, but now we're paying claims. And so that's not possible. And that was one of the reasons why we kind of backed the train up and we're like, well, hold on. If they have zero enrolled, they, we don't even need to know about them yet. And then we're not even coming back and updating the application once they get enrollment. So now that when they're claiming them, they actually have enrollment to support that. So that's sort of where all that came from. And you guys got emails from me earlier this year addressing that. And now you can't even put zero enrollment on the application for participation. So it kind of relates to this. So if you have an enrollment, you don't have to change that every month. We just need to know their enrollment at application renewal, right? 
But now we need to know the um, number of enrolled every month. Is this enrollment, is the enrollment number, their total enrollment, or the number of partic partic participants for the claim? It's the number that is reflective, that it, the number they should re be reported on the claim should be the one that supports the meals claimed. That's what we're looking for. That's what our auditors want to see. How many kids you have enrolled, and is these numbers claimed theoretically possible to be claimed? with this number. And right now, it already does perform a calculation in claims. If you're familiar with how the claims work, you'll, you've gotten that error before. It ties it back to that meal time, maximum number of meals on the application. So that's where you, you know when you put the meal times and you put 12 or seven or whatever there, it might be in between those two numbers. Say they were licensed for seven and then it, they, um, are now licensed for 12 and you forgot to change that on the maximum number of meals and then you go in there and you try to claim it it'll say well that exceeds the maximum number of meals it still is performing a, a calculation when you do the claim to make sure you're not paying them more than they're allowed but we still need to see on the claim that you know you have more enrollments than zero and anyway so i don't know how this is going to affect those of you that do the file upload. I don't think we have a lot of you that do it, but if you know what I'm talking about, just know that we are work. We are aware that that we're going to have to update the um, the template that you use. Which, funny enough, like nobody in our office even is knows what I'm talking about when I talk about that file upload. Karen does because I've showed her how it works now. But it's like the people that were at the SDE when that was created, or they're all gone now. And so I'm like, well, if we add this to the to the uh, family daycare home claim, that's going to mess up the file upload. And they're like, what are you talking about? So some of you know what I'm talking about and some may not. If you use an automated system like Minute Menu, it'll spit out your uh, CSV file and that's your file upload. You upload it into our system and it automatically enters all your accounts for you. So you don't have to sit there and, and do them all individual. It's pretty awesome. But we're adding, we are adding a field now. So we're gonna to have to update that. So I'm kind of gonna to have to rely on you, some of you to do some homework for me um, and reach out to Minute Menu and tell them that we're gonna be adding that parameter onto our claim. Because as you know, it checks certain things when you do that file upload and if they don't match, it'll boot it out. So it'll boot every one of your claims out if we don't get this fixed. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, just ignore me right now. And if you have been at me and you don't use this and you're interested, let me know because it's it'll save you a ton of time. But if one of you guys that are on the Minute Menu can reach out to them and just say like, hey, we're going to add this now. What do we need to do to change our CSV file for the file upload? They might be able to just fix it real easy on your end. It might be easier than our people having to figure out what template works with your system. Does that make sense? So if y'all can work on that now, we're going to get it where it's required and hopefully we can meet in the middle when it's time. Um, and we'll do some testing so that we don't just throw you under the bus and suddenly mess up what you're used to, um, how that you do your claims. Okay. What else? Um, so about how our claim process goes. Um, and wait, first before I go on, you guys know this, but we we'll always like to remind you like, double check your claims before you submit it. When you get all of those sites entered, um, go to the claim summary, view claim summary, and make sure all those counts are correct. Because once you click submit, we have to reach out to IT and have them pull it back. Actually, we have to, we, we can't unsubmit it. We're working on them making a button for that. We can delete it. <laughs> Man, I know you don't want that to happen. So just know that if you make a mistake and you submit it, it's going to re require us to wait on IT to pull it back so you can make that correction. So normally, SDE processes um, on Tuesday at noon, except for the last full week of the month. And the reason being is because that's the week we uh, set aside to do federal reports. So we process on Tuesday. Payments are made on Friday generally. Um, sponsors are required to report their total administrative expenses each month. Um, so this is, makes it easier for your end of year reconciliation. 
um, and that's where you can do it. Please do not submit your claim if you don't know what that number is, okay? I know you wanna get your claims in as quickly as possible, but if you don't know what your administrative costs are for the month yet, you need to wait to submit. That's how it was a long time ago when we did it on paper and we had to break it down by um, line item. So don't just put an arbitrary number in there to get it submitted. And then that's gonna cause you to have to have a revision later. And that's a $0 revision and it doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but it's going to make your, high, your risk indicator go up when we're doing claims validations because now you've got multiple revisions and it's all because you submitted claims maybe before you had the actual dollar. That's not to say mistakes aren't made or you have some bill that comes late and now you've got to reallocate it back to a prior month. We get that, but do your best to make sure to report it correctly the first time. Um, and then there is the option to decline your payment. We don't really have um, many that decline it, but you have the option to decline administrative uh, payments. Okay, and like I said before, there's no limits on the amount of claims revisions that you do, but it is a risk indicator. So the more revisions you do, like what's going on, we've got to look a little closer. Why, why are we having this many mistakes? Sometimes they're not mistakes, and that's what I'm trying to reiterate. If you could prevent a revision, that's not because of a, of a mistake, it's going to help you. And then you guys are also familiar with your 10% carryover. Like I said before, at the end of the year, you have to submit your end of year reports or whatever so that we can reconcile and determine um, uh, what your carryover could or will not be. So during any fiscal year, the sponsor may carry over up to 10% um, of the home times rate, of your administrative fees basically. You do have to submit the end of year um, some kind of report in October, you guys are used to that so that we can reconcile um, and it's down there at the bottom of your application, we'll go back and fill it out and, and figure out your 10%. Um, if, you're, if you exceed that 10% that you have left over in funds, you have to pay it back. So you can't carry over more than 10%. If you do carry over 10%, that's the first funds you have to spend. Unfortunately, um, more times than not, we don't have anyone that has, we don't have sponsors that carry over anything. You typically uh, have spent it or overspent, unfortunately. Any questions on this? You guys are so quiet. Karen, do you have anything to add so far? I'll probably ramble. Sorry, right. trying to find my mic. Oh, okay. No, I do not. Okay. Well, speak up when I say something wrong or miss something. It's not going to bother me. Um, we'll probably go to about just before noon and take maybe like a 30 minute break so you guys have to, can go get some lunch or whatever. Um, so, carrying on. This next topic, it might cause some questions. You already see it in bold on the top bullet point. Um, we're gonna talk about provider application and agreement. And right off the bat, I wanna let you guys know that we are, the state agency will no longer be implementing or allowing the 15 minute leeway before or after the beginning time of a meal time. It just has caused so much confusion since we've gone online. And especially for those of you that also operate an on or operate a computerized system like Minute Menu, um, it's just really hard to make both those systems accommodated. So the bottom line is all we need to know is what is the serving time. If you as a state agent or not state agent, you as a sponsoring organization want to implement a 15 minute leeway, that's great. It needs to be your written policy and you enter your times however you want in your system, but it needs to match what's in ours. And I think that will help eliminate some of that confusion, especially for those that do minute menus. Um, because you're basically, the leeway is not just a built-in 15 minutes, but that's kind of how it's being used to accommodate it in your online systems, uh, in our system and in minute menus. Um, because if they start early, you've got to have that in there. 
um, without having to change it every time. So as a sponsoring organization, you've got to decide how you want to handle that. All we care about as a state agency is we don't tell you how long the meal times have to be. It's got to be reasonable. I mean, I think anything more than an hour is not reasonable, especially for home. I think we've always understood, well, we've always kind of thought it was 30 minutes. There was a 30 minute time limit. It's not. I think it was just kind of an understood thing because it's really, there's nothing in regulation that says the meal time has to be a certain time, amount of time. So whatever the length of meal time it is, it's up to you. If you want to have a type of leeway to allow them some flexibility, that's also up to you. We're not trying to be rigid. We're just trying to make sure we know what times you're allowing a meal to be served so we can show up at the right time. So if you have a leeway, enter in our system with that leeway built in so that we know the provider could potentially start early, but we don't have to worry about it. We'll just show up whenever you have in our system. Does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe so. I thought surely I'd have questions or complaints on this. No, I, this case, this is Donald. I think it's a great idea, but I'm looking at going next year to uh, only one meal time allowed. Is that, oh, really? can I do that in my policy? Yeah. Yeah, you can, um, you can allow only one shift. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, it eliminates some of my uh, frustrations. Uh, yeah. You know, and especially if you're going to allow, you know, a, an hour long, I don't know how long you're, do you just do 30 minute meal times? I do some breakfasts uh, longer uh, yeah. because the kids come in late, but mm -hmm. that's that's max of an hour. But if I do that, I can eliminate having two meal times and eliminate me having uh -huh. to calculate crazy stuff. I agree, and a lot of times those split shifts are just kind of abused um, to allow them to. I don't know. They don't always necessarily have two separate servings. They just kind of open it up to have one big giant long serving time, and that's not what it's for. So I have a question. So the time you want us to put in the provider site is the earliest time they can serve. Yes. Like whatever, as your sponsoring organization, whatever the possible earliest time you're allowing them to serve, that's what we need to know. And we need to know when it starts and when it ends. And if you have a built-in leeway, we don't care. We'll show up when you tell us that it starts and we'll wait till it's served. That's fine. So then it eliminates the possibility of us missing a meal time or you know what I'm saying? It just, it got way too confusing and it was making it harder for your, you guys because you were having to build it in that, that flexibility into your system if you had minute menu and then it wasn't matching what we had in our system. So this hopefully will eliminate that. I hope, we'll see how it goes. But if that's your policy, just like Dr. Tyler said, if, um, you want to, you can, you can make any policy we have, Oklahoma, we pretty much just go by what regulations say. We just follow regs as closely as we can. But if you want to make something more strict, you, you can do that. It's just got to be written into your policy and you really should start it. You can start policies at any time, but it's highly recommended you start it at the beginning of the fiscal year so you can provide it in their new copy of uh, policy and train them on it. Okay, so you have to update the provider's information electronically every year. Every year you guys have to update that, you know that. Um, you fill it out, submit it. Um, make sure that you're really going over those things, including like the um, ethnic and racial data. We noticed that those roll over and never change. Like we've noticed them roll over with like, they started out with one enroll five years ago and they still just have one. Uh, we got we got to update those, especially now that we we are going to um, fix it to where we can uh, we can report better data. We need the most current information as possible on everything always. Um, so I'm not going to go over this. I just feel like I'm re repeating myself over and over. Um, we have a question. If you go to one serving time for a provider, then the max claim during that, yeah. If you go to one, the max they would be able to, 
any one serving time, it can is always the max allowed would still be their license capacity. That is correct. The deadline to update providers, I mean, they should, your provider should always be up to date. But um, if you need to update anything, sorry, I got a phone call. Um, now, I mean, your site maintenance right now, you guys have the ability to go in there. Um, when the new application comes out later on next month, that will be turned off. But like Karen has reiterated, please don't change anything in site maintenance until you have the documentation submitted to her. But if you have any providers that need to be updated, um, do it now because when it rolls over, it's going to already be updated for you. But when it rolls over is when you're going to have to submit it and we'll um, for approval and all that. But I highly recommend that, you know, yeah, you can start on that now. You can start updating stuff now. But like I said, it should be um, it should be relatively up to date, to date always anyway. So that way, when it comes to rollover, it's less you have to do. Um, a lot of you conduct trainings. Um, we're, I've been trying to kind of move these a little bit earlier. So you guys have ample time to do your trainings for your providers in August and when it's starting to get close to rollover time, because I know that's when you guys start doing your renewal stuff. So I would highly recommend if you got your trainings left still with your providers and you're going to get your renewal information from them, as soon as you get that information, start entering it for, you know, for the rollover. That will help you. Um, so here's some things to watch for, and we need to um, talk about what's on the provider application. So we talked about site maintenance. Um, make sure license capacity is correct and it matches the license. If anything needs to be changed, send it to uh, Karen, always your enrollment number uh, on the application must match. I'm trying to read this note that was from Edgar. Must match section D eligibility. This number must match the provider's agreement. Okay, so yeah, we turned all that off. Your enrollment doesn't have to match the ethnic breakdown and all that. We just need you to report the current enrollment. That always needs to be updated, but it's only one time a year. We don't expect you to come back every month and, and update it. But something that the enrollment does have to match is down there at the bottom, if you can picture it in your mind or if you need to pull it up, on the provider application for participation, you have the enrollment towards the top kind of, and then in the very bottom is where you report um, the number of residential and the number of non-residential. You gotta make sure that those two at the bottom add up to match your enrollment basically. Um, provider agreement. So you've got to update your provider agreement every year. We'll talk a little bit about that tiering waiver later and I can pull it up if y'all have questions on how to enter that. But the provider agreements where the ethnic and racial breakdown stuff is what I was just talking about. Make sure your tiering information's up to date. Um, your permanent agreement between sponsoring an organization and family daycare homes. This covers the rights and responsibilities of the SO. And we'll go over the responsibilities of family daycare homes here in a little bit. And then you also have, we're going to go over our tiering, record keeping, your certification statements and signatures. And then we'll go over again about more policies and procedures. Hold on one second. Okay, so tiering determinations. We're going to talk about this for a little bit because um, surprisingly, we've seen a few reviews where we're not quite we're not quite doing this right. So um, I would really like some input and feedback on the things I'm saying um, to figure out what how we can do this better and where we're kind of going wrong. Um, I really would encourage you guys, if you don't have any type of written policy, um, Karen, while I'm rambling on, can you do me a favor? Can you send an email to, do you, I don't know if you have an email for all the field staff 
or ask Jennifer to, to tell them that I'm doing a training. <laughs> That's why I keep pausing because my phone just keeps going off. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I need to just turn my phone off, I guess. All right. So you really need to kind of create some kind of written tiering procedures if you don't already have them. And I know that seems like maybe a bit much, a little extra. But I have found where we have um, situations where we've got people leaving and you kind of show the new person how to do it. And then you just, that person's gone and the new person didn't quite get all the information they need to know. Because there's a lot to tiering. And if you've been doing this for a while, you know it. You mean, you can just rattle it off and do it. And you know how to do it. But for someone coming in brand new, it's, a, it's quite a bit to figure out. And I know for the next year, it's kind of a moot point because everyone's just going to be tier one. But you still have to do, you still have to make sure all your other tiering stuff um, is up to date and accurate. And I would take this time to do that. Um, because even though we have that tiering waiver that's going to allow those tier two people to claim it tier one, um, it doesn't take place of all your other um, procedures you have to do for people that otherwise would qualify tier one. But I really just think it would be a good idea that you have something in writing so that when something happens to you guys and someone else comes in and takes your place, they know here's number one, this is what you do. And like I said, I know that sounds tedious and if you need help with coming up with something, I'm more than happy to help. Um, but we've just seen it more than once that, you know, things just aren't being done correctly with tiering. And unfortunately it's resulting in sponsors having to pay money back because either the tier is wrong or, um, I don't know. Another thing I want to say is, although we do allow it, um, I would recommend you do not rely on third party mapping tools because they're not always up to date. So like your hometown locator, things like that, um, there's been other ones that I've seen used that I hadn't even heard of. Do not Google it. Google, you can Google anything and it'll tell you anything, but don't Google it and rely on what Google tells you. I would use those as a place to start to identify a school. If you're, you're going to qualify them to one by school, if that's the route you're going, um, use it as a place to start to know, okay, well, this is the general area that might be that might be the school that they're assigned to because it's not the school that's geographically closest to that home. It's the one they're in the district of. So if you're in a small town and all you have is one elementary and a high school or even just one school, that's not hard. But when you get in these metro areas where there's, you know, like Oklahoma City, there's a ton of sites, just because you're the closest to one school doesn't mean it's the one that that house is in the district of. So I would suggest using these third party mapping tools as a place to start, but then you need to go to the district and get their information and get their boundary map because that's, that's what's going to be the correct one to go on. And your bigger districts usually have some type of search engine in their own system. You just kind of get in there in their, their district um, website and look for boundary maps. You can, or you can even type in an address, like on Oklahoma City, you can go in there and they have a tool where you put in the address, it's called like a locator tool, I think is what it's called. It'll tell you exactly what schools are assigned to that address. And I'm just stressing that, I'm not trying to make it harder, but unfortunately, if you're relying on stuff that's like hometown locator, um, it is a third party, it is a lot, um, it isn't, we can't control it. So it could give you some wrong information and you might have to pay money back and we don't want that. Um, I, I was going to do some type of activity, but we're not going to do it now because this will be too hard. Um, we could have done it with the in-person people, but I've kind of already, I've, I've already beat that horse about the, the school maps, but I just really, it's very important that you guys are relying on the school district data, not online stuff. And if you need help with it, I will help you. Um, Karen can help you. We have others in our office that are very familiar with how to look up area eligibility. Um, so anyway, yeah, unless you have any questions, I'm going to move on from that. So there's several ways that you can um, qualify a provider as tier one. And as you know, the tier one is the highest reimbursement rate. And um, there's several different ways. I think a lot of sponsors, maybe the first way you kind of start out is with your census data. And you've got the frac.org um, that you can go to, and there's a couple other census areas you can go to, but I would suggest using the FRAC data 
and going to that CACSP, they have a map or tool just for CACSP. And I think you all know how to get there. If not, let me know. But that's probably the easiest and most reliable way um, to first look at area eligibility because it just says yes or no. Yes, they qualify or no, they don't. And sometimes it says a maybe and you have to send it to us. If you ever get a maybe, email it to me and we have a way to, to determine that. Um, so area eligibility can be determined by school data when the home is located in the area served by um, a school in which 50% of the students are eligible for free and reduced meals. So like I said before, you've got to figure out which school that address is assigned with, with, within the, the boundaries of. And then we look at our low income report, which we're now still using the 1920, I believe, because schools haven't had to do that because of um, COVID. You use both census and school data. So you really, you only, when you're qualifying a tier one, you, you go by one or the other. You can use data. I mean, you can use census data first, and if that qualifies them, that's great. You're good. But if, if they're in an area that census like, nope, it's under 50%, then I would move to the school. Because on the census, you can go to that mapper and print off the map and you're sort of done other than documenting your map the proper way. School's a little more tedious because you have to find that map. They both last five years, as you can see on the screen. So it's five years from that determination before it has to be renewed. Um, and like I said, with the schools, it's, uh, we're still using the old, we haven't updated the low income in a couple of years because of COVID and schools haven't had to report that. Um, so I don't know if that will change this year or not, this next year. But like I said, for both of these, the eligibility will be in effect for five years and you have to maintain the documentation, these maps for both of these types. Um, sometimes it might be hard, especially if you're in more rural, rural school, schools, they may not have an actual map. I, it's pretty hard to come by a school that doesn't have a district map, though, something that they can give you. But the whole purpose of the boundary map for a school is so that you, you, what you're supposed to do if you don't know is you get the map and then you have to find the house, the home located within that boundary. And you're supposed to mark it as proof that yes, it actually falls within those boundaries. It's redundant. It seems kind of pointless, but it's regulatory. You have to have it. And on, on those maps, you need to be initialing it and you need to be dating it when that was done. You also need to list the address of the home. And I think I'm going ahead because we talk about it again, but you need to just list the provider's name, the address and the dates of determination. We're finding maps don't have any of that information on there. Sometimes they don't even have the home marked. And that's the whole point of the boundary map is to prove that yes, that house is within those boundaries. Any questions on those two things? Okay, so you're required to keep track of that. Although we put the expiration dates in the agreement, I had to stop and think about where that goes. You, the expiration dates go in the agreements and when they expire, the system just defaults to tier two. That's still gonna happen for those while we're doing, what, while we have this area eligibility waiver that lasts from July till June of next year. Um, because like I said, that the waiver doesn't take place of what you need to already be doing for your providers that are tier one. So if a provider doesn't qualify by tier one by school or by census, the next thing you can look at is um, the provider's household income. And that's when you have to provide them the FSIA and then it has to be verified. So their income has to be verified with taxes, pay subs, um, what have you, or if you do the monthly worksheet that not many of you use that, but it's becoming more um, common especially if we have providers who might have been employed doing something else last year and now they're um, home, family home now, their last year's taxes might be much higher than what their current income is. And that's the point of that monthly worksheet. Um, and it's basically just to determine, it's like a hand a handwritten schedule C if you know what that is. It's just a business profit loss. It shows their actual monthly income. So we can use those as well, or they can be categorically eligible by SNAP, TANF, or uh, FIDFR. Um, and on the slide, it shows you those different numbers and how you can identify what, which is which. 
Um, the income applications are another thing we're seeing not being done properly, not being com fully completed, and then you guys are all approving them when they're not fully completed, and then you're not fully approving them correctly. So um, I included a copy of the FSIA in your handout. Um, you guys have, there's instructions that go with those, and I don't think I included the instructions, but it's in your manual. You've got to make sure that they're complete. If they're not complete, you should not be approving them. That doesn't mean just deny it and say that's it. You deny it and tell them it's denied and let them have another chance. But if if the social for for um, last for the social isn't on there, it's not complete. If it's not signed, it's not complete. You cannot approve it if they're not complete. Then when you're approving them, it's very important that you guys are filling in that stuff at the bottom on the back is not optional like you have to mark the household i mean if unless they're categorical if they don't put any snap or anything and you're qualifying them solely off of in, income you have to put the number of the total income you have to always list the number of households you have to select whether they're tier one or tier two that those selections are or i think that's what it is on there i should pull it up i have it right me. hold on yeah, so there's designations specifically for family daycare homes, what you should be tier one or tier two, and then you need to sign it and you need to date it. Because we're finding that's not being done and we're having to take meals back because those are not approved. Those are not correctly approved applications and if they were deemed tier one and it's not done right, we're going to move them to tier two. So make sure you they're, you know, they're done accurately. And then also your SNAP list that's due to Karen, it's due at every March 15th. Um, that list that you report to her is only for providers who qualify their home as tier one, okay? You might get a ton of income applications that have SNAP numbers, and the vast majority of those are gonna be for providers trying to claim their own child. That's not the providers you're listing on the SNAP on that SNAP list that's due March 15th. Um, and the, every year, you know, and I was trying to, I told, I was telling Karen that when she was doing it this last year, we had a couple, and there was a whole bunch on there. And I'm like, there's no way that's accurate because it, it, I've just kind of been on y'all's side and I've seen it. Generally, if you have a provider who has some type of SNAP benefit, they probably are you're qualifying by um, school or census, generally. Um, so that's not, if they're qualified, their home is qualified by school or census, but then they have a SNAP to claim their own kid. Those are not who we're reporting there. On that SNAP list, we just want the people that the only way they qualify tier one is by SNAP. Does that make sense? Okay. So tier two, we've got all our different tier two. So uh, tier two family daycare homes, they just don't meet the criteria for being classified by tier one uh, by any other way. No way possible. So just straight tier two low, uh, they, they are the ones that they've just chosen to not distribute the SFI, F, FSIA to families, or they just have no children who qualify. They've done it and they just don't have any children that qualify as tier one. Those are the people that are just tier two and just get paid all at the lower rate. And these are the ones that are gonna be benefiting from the waiver. That's soon to, well, already in effect, basically. Um, most, from my experience, most of those tier two people are just like, I don't wanna mess with those income applications and they just don't do them. Then you have your tier two high, which we have very few of these in the, the state of Oklahoma. This is gonna be a tier two provider who by every means possible, you could not get them as tier one, but they passed out those income applications to all their households and every one of those households, families that come to their home for care, they qualify at the, at the higher rate. So they're tier two, but they're paid at the higher rate because all their children coming are um, lower income. And like I said, that's very, not very many. If most of you probably don't even have a tier two high. Then your tier two mix, is the same. They pass them all out, but you have some that are tier one and some are tier two. And that's what we have. Um, we mostly have tier two low and tier two mix. <clears throat> uh, 
um, foster children, we always kind of have some confusion there with that every year, but nothing's changed about that. A foster child is considered categorically eligible to receive free meals regardless of the um, provider status. So there's definitions of foster children or of a foster child. Um, for more information, you know, you can refer to your manual. But a foster child is a child who's living in a household, living with a household, but remains legally responsible of the welfare agency or court. So um, this does not apply to informal arrangements that may exist outside of state or court-based systems. So if you just have like a, a grandparent that's taking care of their grandchildren, but there's no um, court-ordered or state-ordered thing, like that's not what a foster child is. So that instance, they would still have to qualify by income. When you have a foster child that's living in the home of a provider who doesn't qualify any way by tier one, that, so think of a tier two provider and they have a foster child. They would now be mixed tier because that, that foster child is tier one solely because they're a foster child. But the provider still couldn't claim their own kids. I know that gets confusing. They count as part of the household. So when you're calculating that on an income application that has a foster child, they're part of the household. So if the family has four and then there's a foster child, the number of households would be five and you would use that rate of income, but the foster child stands alone and automatically qualifies regardless of the any income. Does that make sense? I'm telling you guys, you guys are quiet. You just want to get this over with, I guess. Providers on children. So the requirements of that, a provider's children must be enrolled and participating in the child care program during the time of meal service. So often I've seen that. Um, in my own experience, being doing uh, experience doing uh, monitoring reviews, that you got the providers on children in their bedroom eating their breakfast, and the other kids are at the table. Well, you can't claim them if they're in the bedroom eating breakfast. They have to be there, part of that meal service. So stress that. Um, other enrolled children must be present and participating, and then the family and family size and income application must be on file showing the provider's eligibility. Nothing about that has changed. The waiver that's in place for area eligibility also has not changed it. Are they still foster if they are adopted? No, I don't think so. I think once they're adopted, they're just part, legally part of that household now. There, I could be wrong. There could be different instances and we would have to reach out to DHS to know. So you need proof of income for this part. For providers to claim their own children, you do not have to have proof of income. Now, I was, no, I can't even say that. You can't even require it. But these you take for face value. The only ones you have proof of income for are when they're trying to qualify their whole home as tier one. When it's a provider's own, or if it's like a tier two provider passing them out to their um, children enrolled, we do not ask for proof. The ERA eligibility waiver has not affected this either. So if you have a tier two provider and they're tier two every way, they possibly can be two, tier two, and now they're gonna be paid at the higher rate because of the eligibility waiver. And I'm sure I'll say this again later when we get to that slide. Um, they still can't claim their own child if they don't qualify by income. So nothing changes about that. They'll just be, be receiving a higher rate for their enrolled children. Okay, so I already kind of honed in on this. Um, I won't beat this horse again, but make sure that applications are completed. If they're not complete, you know, either, either just tell them, like, this is not complete and give them the chance to redo it, um, or just deny it and have them, they can always re-complete re a new form. But don't approve it without all the information. If any of it's missing, uh, not readable, questionable, inconsistent, ask questions, get it, don't approve it if it's not on there. Um, and like I said before, an FSI must be approved at face value unless it's those tier one homes and we need proof for those. And then the effective date, we've, all, we've, um, we've been saying this the last couple of years, so you got to make sure the effective date is within the month, basically, that you got it or the claim month. 
We can't really backdate them. This is just a reminder that you're calculating um, the income correctly. It, it makes a difference whether they're every two or twice a month. Right. And make sure to mark whether they're tier one or tier two. That's the part where you need to mark. And like I said, I know it seems it, it's picky because clearly you can see the calculations and know whether they're tier one or tier two, but if you're not marking it, it's not pro properly approved. So make sure that um, you're calculating your income correctly. Every two weeks is times 26 and twice a month is 24. Yeah, we're missing a, a, a two there, aren't we? Weekly is not, yeah. It's weekly times, nice catch, Jeffrey. I don't know how that happened. Weekly times 52, you're correct. And this is something else that um, I'm not always really good about looking for when I'm doing reviews either, but it's required. You guys have to send the provider verification results and there's a form and I think I have it in your handouts. I can't remember what I all put all in there because it's a whole bunch. But anyone that fills out a family size and income application, you have to send them their verification results. They have to be notified. So you need to make sure you're filling that form out and sending it to them and keeping a copy in their files as proof that you did that. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, just look for that form and start doing it. <laughs> I'm not going to go on much detail about this. You guys know at one time distribution of FSIAs were it had to come in a sealed envelope. It had to be, it's still confidential, but providers can collect them and give them back to you basically now. So regardless of how we, you can, they can collect them either way. Either the provider collects them and gives them to you or the household submit directly to the SO. It doesn't matter. Either way, it's fine. Any of our forms, specifically the um, income applications, we, we can we have access to them in other languages if needed. So there's the link there. And then here's where I'm going to talk about the area eligibility, where I've probably already said this at least twice. So if you have any tier two providers, you will be utilizing this waiver. Yes, we're going to break here in just a few minutes. Um, so if you have any tier two providers, you will be using this waiver and you should, um, Karen can speak to this because I kind of just, once I got them all, I passed it off to her. So you've probably heard from her if we needed any additional information on that waiver application. So we have to know your plan. And we've kind of told you what the plan is and uh, we've put things in place to help prevent us paying them past that date because it's crazy. Like this waiver starts for July and ends in June of next year. It's like half of one fiscal year and half of another. Um, but USDA, all these waivers have been based off of the school year because that's where the biggest impact has been. So um, it is what it is. We just got to make sure we don't pay them those tier two past that, past that um, deadline. You have to have that approved plan on file. So I think we've collected those from everyone. They should be approved. Um, I don't know, Karen, you speak to that if that's not true, but I, I think we have we have some sponsors that don't have any tier two, so it wouldn't apply to you. And like I said before, the waiver, it, does, it doesn't take place with any other nor normal tiering procedures that you would be conducting for all your other tier one people. You know, if the tier one otherwise qualifies as tier one, just keep doing what you're doing. This is only for the folks who are tier two and you've never been able to get them tier one any other way. And then again, providers will still qualify by income to claim their own children. So yeah, we will, um, I'll, we'll talk about the COVID waivers here in a little bit um, because surprisingly we're about halfway through because I just rambled on and you guys aren't asking a lot of questions. So um, we'll have a chance to talk about those later, but um, we still have the, the monitoring waiver in place. So you can still continue to do desk reviews as long as you feel it's necessary. Um, we have been encouraging our institutions to start getting back out there because we're just seeing it's just crazy it's like folks have forgotten what's going on and they're just i don't know if they're just used to little a little less monitoring going on and it's not just 
family daycare homes with all of our institutions. Um, so we do, when you, when you feel safe and you can go out there, we encourage it. But now with this, with the new Delta variants and the cases going back up, you guys need to take care of yourselves. So when you're not comfortable or if you have, um, you know, compromised immune systems, don't, don't go out there. We have the monitoring waiver. We, it has been extended. The current one you're on, we dated it when, before we got the extension. So it's the last one you guys signed that ends September 30, but the new extension we got, I don't know, I can't keep track of all of them, but um, we'll have you guys sign another one. But basically it's been extended until 30 days past the um, public health emergency. And that's not up to anyone but the White House. So even regardless of what our state decides to do, if we're not even, we're not put back under any other type of restrictions, um, it's up to the White House to determine when the public health emergency is over and we have 30 days past that when we have to start doing on site. So that was a really long response to, yes, you can continue to do desk reviews as long as you see fit. But I would encourage you that if you have healthy enough individuals and you're you're well enough when you see situations that need more attention to get out there and do it when you can. Like I said, I don't know. People are just kind of losing their minds. I don't know what's happened. Um, any questions about anything that I've just rambled on about? You guys haven't asked very much question. And I just knew the 15 minute leeway thing would just, you guys would not like that. Maybe you do like it. It'll cause less confusion. Yes, you can do a hybrid. You can do whatever you see fit. There's really no restriction. You still just have to somehow do three reviews of some sort. We don't care who's doing what, um, whatever you whatever you choose. Okay, good. I, I think the 15 minute thing when it was the state decided to do that. It was too much trouble. Back when everything was on paper, it made sense. But now that everything's so strict and we have it in the system and we have a system that's going to disallow it one minute past, it just made it so confusing. Okay, so we'll take a quick break. Um, unless you guys have any questions about anything I just rambled on about. I think the, the major things I really want you to take from what we've just discussed is the the tiering procedures, um, have some type of written, and I, I said, I know what, that sounds like more than necessary, but um, you really need some kind of plan written out. So you might know how to do it, but the person after you or someone taking your place may not. Let them know where to start. And don't rely on those third-party engines, to, search engines to help you find those schools. You need to rely on the school data. Um, because otherwise you're putting, you're putting your sponsorship at Jeopardy and you might have to um, pay money back. So I have a question here. So to be clear, if lunch is 11 to 11.30, can the child clock in at 11.29 and still be? Yes. We don't care how long it takes the child to eat the meal. They just have to be in attendance before the meal service was over. And along the same lines of, I'm trying to get all of us on the same page as sponsors. I'm trying to also get our consultants all on the same page. Um, because it's been confusing for them too, because if we've got this 15 minute leeway and some do minute menu and have it in their system one way and the others do it on paper, it's just been confusing. So that's why as long as you know, all we need to know is it starts and it ends. And if the child is there within that time, they can be claimed. That's what we also have to let our consultants understand. And they will go by that, you know, that same. It's just been all over the place because it's been confusing with the 15 minute thing. And I think that will help us and it will help our consultants be consistent too. The other thing besides tiering was the income applications. Make sure you guys are approving those correctly. Um, the fact that we're having, we, we continue to have state audits because we continue to have findings. That's not uncommon. Um, but now our auditors require us to collect all this additional information. And whereas in the past, we might've been able to let things go and just be like, you know, look, you didn't do this quite right. 
can you please fix it? And next time, make sure it's fixed. We can't do that because now we have the documentation that shows a mistake and an error and we've not um, documented it. So it's really kind of taken away our wiggle, wiggle room to be more flexible and we're still trying as much as possible, um, but we just need to make sure you guys are doing it, everything as, as best as you can. And if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask. So if you in relation to our work, which I don't know if I'm going back to work or not, but I'm Okay. <laughs> you get I'm muted. I've been listening to it all morning. My boss said you don't have to sit through the whole thing. So <laughs> I think him a while ago and asked him. Somebody is unmuted. Because if I know all this stuff, I'm sure he's bored after. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they may. I'm waiting for somebody to mute so I can finish and we can. Okay, there we go. Thank you. So if we break until like, how long do you guys need? You want 30 minutes? You want an hour? We're halfway through everything. So you tell me, is 30 minutes enough? And yes, if you have questions about applications, okay, ask Karen. She, that, she, she is on it with applications. So she's the gal to go to. So we'll break for 30 minutes. We'll come back at 12, 15 then and finish up. Is 12.15 okay for everyone? Okay. We will see you back here in 30 minutes.
Alright guys, I gave you a few extra minutes. We'll get going here. Hopefully everyone's back. Can get resituated again. I apologize for the barking and snoring and slurping of water dog in the background. So the joys of working from home. Again, um, I did have a question in the chat that someone kind of got booted out of Zoom for a little bit after you got started. Um, you guys have to be in participation. You have to be in the Zoom for at least 75% of the Zoom. I mean, obviously we want you here for the whole time, but the way we have it set up is you need to be in here for 75% of the time to receive credit. Um, but if you have multiple people uh, together, I see you putting it all in the chat and I appreciate that, but I will not remember that. So do a sign-in sheet and email it to Karen and I, and we will make sure everybody gets a certificate. Hopefully that gave everybody enough time. I'm trying to get an email pulled up. So I had a question from someone through an email while we were on break asking, asking me to go back um, and go over something real quick that we discussed. And the reason I was kind of late was because I wanted to call Jennifer and make sure I was not giving you guys any misinformation. Please guys, um, don't be afraid to speak up and ask questions. If you're wondering something, somebody else is. And just because you ask a question doesn't mean we're gonna assume you're doing it wrong or, you know, just please speak up. That's why we're here. So the question was concerning um, financial viability and, and how that's supposed to work. And when we talk about financial viability and what it means to be financially viable as a sponsor, it means that you should be able to operate not only administratively, but also have enough funds, um, operational costs, which is the money you receive to pay your providers. You should have enough of that on hand to be able to operate um, for an indefinite amount of time without our funds. Um, that doesn't mean that you're going to have to, you'll make payments and then suddenly something's going to happen and you won't get that reimbursement back. That's not how these programs work. Um, I think that the question kind of alluded to the fact that back uh, many years ago, how payments happen, um, you didn't get your funds in October in enough time for how you operated. And, and so you had to use your own funds to operate or to um, have enough money for administrative funds to pay salaries and all that junk supplies. I shouldn't say junk, but you know what I mean. Um, but you didn't have to pay your providers. You didn't have to come up with that money until you could claim that that's not financially viable. That's and then I know I'm probably not making any sense. And if anybody who wants to speak up and ask questions about this, don't be afraid to do so because now is the time. But Financially viable means you have enough money to operate and you have enough money to pay your providers. Because stuff happens, like government shutdown, that happened. We quit receiving funds when that happened. Um, when the rates don't come out, things like that. When we, when we get shut down at the national level, we cannot pay you. But that doesn't mean we're not going to come back and, and pay those reimbursements. When a claim is submitted to you, as a sponsor, you have the responsibility to pay that claim within 45 day, days, basically. That's, that's regulatory, it's in there. We Just the same as when you submit your claim to us, we're supposed to have 45 days to pay it. Um, we should not exceed that. And you know we're kind of sweating it, we're, we're, we do sweat it on this side too because we have to meet those same regulations. So if the government shut down and we're not getting funding or if um, the rates aren't out, things like that, if we can't pay, we're, we're our, Compliance is in jeopardy as well. We've all got deadlines you've got to meet. When you have a claim that's submitted to you, you have 45 days to pay. It. So as a sponsor, you're still supposed to pay that even if we aren't able to provide reimbursement. It's not going to come around and something, you know, the program won't not, not be authorized or a bill won't be passed. That's not how this, these programs operate. We're not, we're never going to just suddenly end the program and not provide payments after the fact. Does that make sense? So don't be concerned that we expect you to pay 
providers and pay them those payments and then you're not going to be reimbursed for it. That's not what we're saying. You will be reimbursed for those costs. But in the event that there's um, lapse in payments or some type of program interruptions, in this last year it's happened more than, um, than in, in years past just because we've had different things that have interrupted it all, it all ties back to COVID. Um, you still have to make those program payments and be in compliance. So I just wanted to go over that because I had a question about it. Any questions? Any, is this, does that spark any other questions? I don't want it to be alarming. Um, it shouldn't be. We, we don't want you guys to have to operate on your personal funds or lines of credit or what have you, but you have to have that in place in the event that we can't pay you in a timely manner for reasons out of our control. If you don't have any other questions, I'm going to move forward. Okay. Um, so the next thing we'll discuss is training and I really need input on this one. Um, you guys have been quiet. It's time to speak up. I need your feedback. So um, it kind of came up when we did the ounce equivalence training. We really want to try to start to start providing, I'm jumping ahead, I do that, but let me wait till I get to that slide. Let me just go over this first. So we all have required training, right? Sponsoring organizations have required training for the key staff. We kind of went over that in the beginning. And these are the topics. Um, technically it's seven topics that claims and submission and claims review procedures. We just lumped together because it's sort of the same thing. So there's technically one, um, USC refers to it. There's seven required topics. Topics. So you just have six lines there. Anyway, you all have to have training on that every year. You know that. That's why you're here. It is required now, like I said. So if you have other people in your um, a, your agency or your organization that's not able to be trained, um, find the way to get them trained before the end of the fiscal year, because we do look at that. I'm sorry, I'm reading the question. Not quite sure on the enrollments you were asking for the claims and since Minute Menu has to be contracted, is any sponsor willing to call Minute Menu? Is anyone going back on the enrollment? You know how we're adding the enrollment on the claim? Can anyone step up and volunteer to be the representative of Oklahoma to, to contact Minute Menu to see what needs to be changed in your system to accommodate that? I can do it, Cassie. Okay. Thanks, Jalen. So we'll, we'll get an answer when you do get an answer. If you can send it on to me and we can share it. Yep. We'll just share it with everyone. It doesn't apply to everyone, but I, I really think we can fix what we need to in our system and they can do what they need to do to have it included in that CSV file and we should be fine. So we'll see. Okay, where was I? Training, <clears throat> just make sure you get your people trained and you keep it on file. That's one thing we see we see a lot um, it written up in in uh, administrative reviews. So make sure your people are trained, and then make sure your providers are trained. You also have to maintain those records. Uh, way back when, when we turned stuff in, Karen, do we ask or somebody speak up? We the last couple of years have we required you guys to send these in at, app, at application renewal? I know we talked about it, but I don't know if we ever implemented it. Because used to, when we did paper applications, you had to turn in the training records. Um, nobody I did that. it my first year, which would have been 2019, and then 2020, we didn't have to do it. Really? Okay. So I really think it's something, yeah, I think um, I'm going to say it now out loud so everybody can hear it. This will be something we need, and Karen, you too, if we didn't do it last year, we, need, we really need to have them um, on file because auditors are asking for it. We have to show it that not only are our staff and our sponsors, but also our providers are trained. So be um, expecting to submit those. So this is what I started to talk about and then I stopped. Training Can I pause you for a second? Yep. I have a question on it. So our trainings will be offering in person and on Zoom. So can, you know, we'll do a sign up sheet for the ones in person, but the ones on Zoom, can we just send you the Zoom log or just yep. have the registration? Yep, that's fine. Okay. That's fine. Yep, that works. Um, okay, 
So we did the ounce equivalence training and I don't remember when that was. And we did it just for family daycare homes because really you guys are kind of, a, you are a unique group and you have questions that really don't apply or other things that don't apply to any of our other institutions. So we really wanna kind of try to break apart and do some specialized training for you guys. However, we have a ton of training that's offered monthly, which right now it's kind of wonky because we've switched back to just like our manual training, which is like the all day training. And you guys don't need to take that. Like this training right here, if you hear me speaking right now, this is suffice for your institution's training requirements for the fiscal year. And after we get past all these annual, oh, I think they're listed in there as the manual trainings, we'll go back to our kind of specialized trainings. We've really revamped how we've done training. Um, and COVID, it's COVID's fault, but I think it's great because it's allowed us to be able to offer way more training, um, smaller, shorter trainings, and focus on stuff that you guys need help on. And sometimes I think that it looks a lot of those trainings when you go in there and look at them, you probably assume they're geared towards centers and other institutions, but a lot of them really, it applies to you guys too. So I just implore you to take advantage of those trainings that we have. And we've got a meal patterns training. We have a food buying guide training, which I'm going to talk about that again later. It's August 5th. I think every one of you guys need to go to that food buying guide training because that's where we're seeing that you all need the most help. And historically, We've never really used the food buying guide with our family daycare homes because it was hard to really apply, be able to apply that food buying guide to why a small family daycare home, how that could help. But you'll find that it, it really is helpful for you once you understand what you're looking at and what to look for. So I encourage you know, it, at least one of you from your institution to attend that training August 5th. You will find it very helpful. If you've had a recent review where you've been written up for meal pattern issues, you're gonna have a lot of your answers, your questions answered there about um, some of those things. And we'll touch on here about some of the meal pattern issues too. Um, so anyway, I say all that though, we also have the, the multi-sided training and that would be helpful for you guys too, but it's really pretty vague. You guys are good on the multi-sided sponsoring organization. That's what you've always done and you're familiar with those. So you could take it if you want. If you have a newbie, you might have them take it. Um, there's also administrative and purchasing training that might not be as applicable for you guys because it goes over forms that really does hone in on, on centers, but just get in there and look at all the different trainings we have. But with that said, are there other training topics that you would like to see offered for you guys that that we haven't before and i really want you guys to have some feedback and type in the chat um karen's going to take notes because we really want to try to start providing some better training for everyone so if there's other topics please please let me know um the other thing that's been suggested is round table we've thrown that idea around um, every year we have training, we talk about it, and it just never really comes to fruition because it's not that easy. I mean, some of you are pretty far away. So I wonder, would you guys be interested in um, a roundtable type of discussion monthly, every other month, that we could just do it Zoom? Would that be helpful? Yes, I would love to be training on monitoring from the desk. Okay, that's a good one. So like a training on how to do a desk review. That's a good idea, Denise. Sure. Okay. I really think we could make the round table thing kind of work for those of you that want to be involved with it um, when we do it Zoom. But like I said in an email before, we've got to have, it still takes up someone's time on our end. We've got to have participation to keep it going. So I hope if we initiate it, we can keep it going. And I'm getting a lot of responses. Um, some of you are still quiet. So I don't know if you guys just like have me muted or you don't want to speak up. Um, even if it was one topic each month, yes, that's a great idea. Okay, 
So we will maybe for the new year start get something like that planned. I think it's a great idea as well. Okay, so then something else came up um, when we did that ounce equivalence training. Um, I don't think we made it clear that it was just for sponsors and then it got sent out to providers, which isn't terrible, but really, like I said, historically, we've never really trained the providers because USDA expects the sponsor to. But then it kind of got us to talk and like, and we reached out to other states and a lot of other states do train their providers. So we thought about maybe offering some type of training directly to your sponsors. Um, and so I really want your feedback on that. I know that it could it could be helpful sometimes to hear some of the stuff coming straight from the State Department to them. Because I know sometimes when you're trying to implement things, they don't want to hear it, but if you just be like, the state said so kind of thing, sometimes that's helpful. So um, what, are, what are your thoughts on us offering training directly to providers? I think that would be great because they would hear from one person and I think it would be very helpful. Okay. I do, I know, what are the specific topics that you would prefer us to cover and then are there any that you would like us to avoid? Because I know we do have some variances um, in, in what you, you know, you might have more stricter policies. Like I would wanna do a training on cycle menus because not everybody requires them, but we could do one specifically on meal patterns. But if you have, if you have any type of other restrictions that are different than our OCN labels, that'd be a good one. Review audit forms. So like their monitoring, like the monitoring review, like what, what we look for on all their forms. Yeah, okay. Because I'm really thinking we're gonna have to stick to the stuff that we really, it's very specific. Like you guys can't do a monitoring review really any differently than we tell you how. So that would be a good one. Um, CN labels are just CN labels, we could really, do that and maybe even we could we could do something about meal patterns that's just really talking about what's a creditable you know food item versus steering away from like cycle menus i just am afraid we'll get questions from, well my sponsor does this why doesn't that sponsor do it that you know that might come up so i don't know if that would be a concern no patterns in time Well, and see, that's the other thing. I don't know. I don't know if we would be able to count our trainings as for CECPD. Because it's really hard to kind of fit into their rubric of what, I don't know, it depends on what the training was about. If it was specifically about nutrition, we might could do it. I'd have to talk, but I really don't think we could make it count for their CECPD. Infant menus, that's a good one. Sorry, I'm writing all this down. Okay, so I'm glad you guys are speaking up because I thought maybe you just logged in and turned me off, turned me down and <clears throat> anyway. Okay, cool. Well, Karen and I will get together and get something planned. Um, and maybe on our first, first round table, maybe we can plan to have one in October sometime we can really kind of get a good game plan about what kind of training and, and when and how we do these for your providers. I think it would be helpful. Um, I, when I was on your side of things, I always kind of wish we had something like that available because it is nice to hear it, you know, from one person and coming from the state, you know. Okay, moving on. Provider record keeping. So this part is essential to the integrity of this program. All of the items listed um, in this slide are items that need to be maintained uh, so that at any given time, SCE staff or USDA may request and review the documentation. If your institution decides to utilize forms other than what's available, for, other than what we create, you got to submit the forms to us and let us approve them first. And then, you know, your consultant needs to know too, but it's really kind of easier just to submit to Karen and I, we'll approve and make sure they have all the um, information they need to have on there. And then we'll let your consultant know um, because anything that varies from what we normally have could be approved. And if it's missing something, it could cause a finding. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry guys.
Okay. So the enrollment form it must be completed annually for every child enrolled with a parent signature and the date it was signed to validate the form. Um, duplicate copies must be maintained. You really have to have one at the sponsor's office and with the provider. Um, they must be on form on file before claiming before allowing a claim for any meals for that that child. And like I said before, I'm going to work on updating the one we have because um, we really still are waiting on guidance from USDA. Sometimes it takes a very long time for that to come on how to collect that uh, ethnic, ethnic and racial data. So I'm going to go ahead and provide that on an updated copy of the enrollment. So at least you have a way to collect it. You won't have to create anything new. If you have your own enrollment, add it to that. So at least we're showing our due diligence to collect it. If your forms haven't changed for some time, you don't need them approved. If you're using the same thing you've always been using, just go with it. It's just anything new going forward needs to be approved. Um, daily and arrival departure uh, must be maintained to ensure a child was in attendance at the time they were claimed. Um, we talked about that. That goes without saying. It seems very common sense, but you would be surprised the meals that we have disallowed at times because they were claimed and the child wasn't there. Uh, the daily record of meals, or otherwise we refer to them in our office as the DROMs, that's just the menu, can be found in the manual and it must be completed as well. That form um, allows us to, to make sure, and some of you guys have them com combined. It's just a sheet where you are marking which meals are claimed for, or uh, which kids are claimed for what meals to ensure no more than the three, two meals and a snack or two snacks and a meal are claimed. That's the purpose of that. Um, you guys may have created your own, or you may use our own as well. Um, the weekly menus is served can also be found in our manual. Um, it's where the menus the menu is re recorded, basically. And it has to be maintained daily. And it should not be completed ahead of time. It should be something completed daily. It should be up to the date of the review in um, Obviously, it should only include allowable and creditable food items, which we'll talk more about later. Uh, the building for the future, you guys know about that. <coughs> you have, they have to uh, supply all their enrollments with a copy of the building for the future. And then you also have to have, uh, providers have to have a WIC brochure posted. So like I said, if you need more of those, or I would just always contact DHS directly and they can send you these quick brochures, but we can send you some if you need it. And some additional forms that you need to keep on file, uh, documentation of special dietary needs. It's got to be on file for meals that, that don't meet meal patterns due to um, medical reasons or other special dietary needs. And then your provider helper form. You have to have that on file if they have helpers, and it has to be re um, renewed yearly. And really, you need to stress to your provider that if they're not going to be home, for any amount of time that you know you or we could show up for a monitoring review, somebody needs to be there if they're operating. If there's kids in care and they have a helper, that person needs to be knowledgeable enough about the CACSP to be able to direct us to where the paperwork is and know, you know, what it, what should be served to be a creditable meal. So um, make sure they have a plan B if they're not always there, and that their plan B includes. A, the helper person that's knowledgeable of the program. <clears throat> okay, so monitoring. Pre-approval visits are required to be conducted by the sponsor and it must be held on site with, it, with the exception while we have the waiver for each family daycare home prior to the beginning of operating the particip participation in CACFP. And like I stated before, they have to have kids already enrolled before we can approve them. What if they serve and leave before the time ends? Um, they can do that as long as the child was there in attendance with by the time the meal started. If they were, they can't take the meal with them, but if they were served a meal and eat it real quick and then leave, that's fine. That's the same as if they serve the meal and the kid sits there for an hour, which would be my kid. So, yeah, as long as they're in attendance by the time the meal starts <clears throat> and they eat the meal on site. 
Okay, pre-approval. Um, we've talked about this. It's got to be conducted within four weeks, 28 days of operating day, first operating day. On-site monitoring review instructions are in your manual. Um, as you know, you have to pick one of two methods. Either you're going to do the review averaging or the one announced and two unannounced. <clears throat> Most of you, if not all, do the one announced and two unannounced. If you do review averaging, um, you have to have a plan in place. Um, you have to have a plan in place to explain to us how you'll ensure that you still end up with three visits on average per provider. Basically, that's so to allow you that if you know you have a provider that needs a little extra CLC and attention, you can pay that to that person um, and less to another. But I would just recommend if someone needs some extra love, go give them some extra love and still do what you need to do. Because sometimes you just have those that need extra help. But whatever your method is that you've cho chosen, you have to make sure that you're, you're, you follow it and that at no point do you ever go beyond six months in between visits. So you have to make sure you don't, you don't let six months, more than six months lapse in between uh, reviews. <clears throat> um, what else? So you also, you have to make sure that your reviews um, are the timing of them, of your unannounced review, well, all your reviews is unpredictable. It's, and, and that's pretty easy to do. It's hard to put that on paper. You have to uh, supply that as a response on page two of your sponsoring organization. Um, but you have to make sure, and it's just something as simple as we'll make sure to go out on a different week of the month, a different day, and a different meal time each time, just so that it's not so um, predictable. Licensing requirements for fall, small and large family daycare homes. You have a handout in there that um, gives you a pretty easy breakdown. If licensing has it in their um, handbook and it's only for the large, but we created one for the small um, family daycare homes. That's an easy cheat sheet for you to use when you're do, conducting um, your monitoring reviews to make sure that they're not out of ratio. You know, just because they have no more than seven kids doesn't mean they're not out of ratio because they, depending on how many and what age, they could be well over. And, and I think you all are familiar with that. But it is our responsibility to make sure that they are within licensing ratios. And if they're not, um, we should be contacting Deeka because it's not okay. Something else, um, five-day reconciliation. Hey, Cassie. Yeah? Um, I think you should bring up about the, um, the disability of the, like the child over at 13, child oh. over 12. Okay, so, um, well, there, there are some different caveats about your, your ratios and how that works with licensing. One of which is if, and you guys should know this, and then I'll talk about what you, you just said, um, the provider's own children, they don't count in their ratio once they're over five years old. And I think that form states that. Then also what Karen's talking about is in CACFP, they can have a child in their home up until the age of once they turn 19. In CACFP, you can't, those children can be claimed um, if they have a documented uh, disability. You've got to have that documentation like any other, um, for whatever reason, you got to have that on file, but they can. Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're yeah, talking about? It's the, yes, it's the medical statement uh -huh. and uh, say if, if they're on an IEP, then. Uh -huh. We need a copy of the IEP. Mm -hmm. You're going to keep a copy of the IEP on file. and But yeah, a child up until the age, till they turn 19, can be in the home and they can be claimed. Regardless, we even have some, I think, or we have before that um, had a, the, their medical need. They can only be tube fed. And it was an older child. And that is still claimable um, because that's all they can have. And the provider took the time to administer the food to that child, uh, so. Okay, five-day reconciliations. Um, you guys have, these are not optional. They're a pain in the neck, I know. We don't like them either. We have to do them when we come out, but they're not optional. Every provider that's up for review every month has to have a five-day reconciliation. It is part of the monitoring review form. However, 
you have the flexibility to do them not at the review. And, and that's kind of the way I did them. And then even when I'm doing um, administrative reviews right now and I, we go conduct them ourselves, we don't do them there on site because it's just like crazy. Meal times are crazy. And you just want to do what you need to do, observe the meal, look at the paperwork. Do the five day reconciliations before or after the review. That's fine. You can do it on the month prior. You can even do it. You can wait for them to submit their claim on the month that when you did the review and do it then, as long as it's conducted within that same month that they are up for review, you've got to have those five day reconciliations. And I know it seems um, arbitrary because you guys are doing basically doing that for the entire month when you're doing edit checks, um, but it's regulatory. I, no matter what, we have to do them. No matter how redundant it seems, you have to do them and you have to have them on file. And the point of five-day reconciliation is to make sure that you're comparing the enrollment information to the attendance, and you're also um, comparing the attendance to the meals claimed. So you got to make sure that, okay, well, are the, these kids actually attending the times that their enrollment information, the enrollment form said they should be attending? And it should be raising some flags like, okay, well, maybe the enrollment form needs to be updated because maybe the child's, you know, days of attendance or times of attendance have changed. That's, that's the purpose of this because the enrollment information should match what's really happening and they should only be claimed for meals during those attend the, the time of attendance. Um, there's many of you, again, that are on Minute Menu. Um, that you have the automated, the option to pull the automated one, but just pulling it is not enough. Like it does, it analyzes it for you, but it, it, when you print it and you look, there's a legend and it tells you it's like red or yellow, or I can't remember. Obviously red means like something's not right. Um, you have to show that you've looked at it and made sure what it's, the flags are, have been assessed. Generally, if you're, you, you know, you've got minute menu, the red ones on the, they've been disallowed. And you could go and look at the claim and see, oh, this is red, this means this meal can't be claimed because that child wasn't in attendance or something. I'm just sort of making stuff up, but you've got to show you're looking at them to make sure your system's really doing what it's supposed to be doing. But there's other ones that might be marked where it's just like a warning, kind of like what I told you before, like, oh, well, hey, the child was in attendance and they were claimed for the meal and that's fine, but their enrollment data says they don't normally attend. Well, that's a red flag and that's stuff that we're getting dinged on and you're going to get dinged on because why does the enrollment form say the kid is here from eight to three every day, but they're being claimed for a, a supper consistently at five o'clock. So that's the point of the five day reconciliation. Doesn't matter if you've created your own, you use ours or you use minute menu. You have to show that you're doing them and keep them on file. Y'all have any questions about that? Okay. Um, what else? Monitoring schedule. This is something kind of new too. I don't think, well, I added it to this, this PowerPoint this year. I don't know if we've discussed it or sent anything out, but it's something that our auditors are telling us you all need to have a, a way to, to show that you have a schedule for keeping up with your monitoring. So, I don't know whether Minute Menu, I think it has a way to print something to show you what, you know, what's due or some way to track that. You may have your own schedule that's a spreadsheet. I know some people, there's a couple different sponsors that are using um, like index cards. You have index cards where you put the information on there. You just have some way to track it. If we have to see that you have a method that ensures your reviews are planned and that they're not going to be late and that they're going to be done timely. Okay, so kid care does have a way. Cool. And that's fine. But if you don't have that or you don't use it, you've got to come up with a way to show you have a schedule. So if you don't have one, get it um, before your next review because we will ask for it. Household contact documentation. I'm not really going to go over that. We don't use it much. But in, in the event that you ever question, you know, the, the valid validity, I guess, of a claim and you guys know you when you get a claim in and it's the same kid 
eight to four or eight to five every day. They're playing for the same meals every day. That's sort of a red flag. That's not saying it's going to never happen. But it should raise a red flag. And if you ever question that, or if something ever comes up that questions whether or not that child even really exists, because that happens too, that's what the household contract documentation form is for. Um, oops, I got that in this way. Okay, and then the COVID waivers. Um, and I've got another slide that talks again about COVID waivers, but we have the monitor monitoring waivers still in effect. We discussed this. The current one is set to end September 30th, but they extended it to the end 30 days after whenever this has, when, it, when the White House, when the president decides that this public health emergency is over, that doesn't look to be anytime soon. Um, so I think probably some kind of training on desk reviews would be a great idea. I'm glad, glad somebody threw that out there. Um, you will have to do another waiver application. That's because we're having to track all this information. Everything we're doing differently, we have to report somehow to USDA. So um, we'll get that created and you'll have to do it on application renewal. It's not going to, don't worry about it. We'll get what we need from you. We just need to make sure we have something from you stating, yes, we're going to utilize the waiver if you choose to do so, which I think every one of you did. Okay, monitoring staffing ratio. Uh, and I, we already talked about this too, but only monitors, only people who are actually going out doing visits should be listed on that page two on your staffing ratio area of the sponsoring application. It shouldn't list a person who does clerical work. Doesn't mean what they do doesn't help someone else do more um, reviews, but you have to have enough people um, that are actually going on site doing reviews. Every time you add or remove a provider, that, that page on your application should be updated. And we cannot approve providers if you do not have, if you don't meet the requirement to the monitoring staffing ratio. It's specifically, it's based on a specific number of um, providers, depending on whether they're rural or metro in the metro area, how many full-time employees you need to be able to conduct those reviews. And that's something you need to think about. And that was the question listed on that, your plan for that tiering waiver. You know, if, if you guys are planning to try to recruit some providers that are tier two and they don't participate because it's just not worth the time and effort and now you're going to try to recruit them, you need to think about that too. Like, um, and I think Karen addressed some of those and we got, you know, we got it corrected. Just saying, oh, well, we're okay right now. Doesn't address the fact that if you sign on more people, it could affect how many people you need doing reviews. So anyway. We already talked about this. Um, timing of unannounced reviews, it must be varied and they may not, they must not follow a consistent predictable pattern. Um, for example, we this we we had an, and I think I used this example before, but we had a sponsor that pretty much always did their late um, supper and late evening uh, snack reviews in the summer um, because they were in an area where they didn't want to be out past dark. It was not the greatest environment or neighborhood. And so they would always do those later meals in the summer because it was later, lighter later, if that makes sense. Well, that's predictable. So that's just one kind of vague, it was sort of out there. And they actually told us that's what they did. And we're like, we can't do that because that, that is a predictable pattern. So like it says, if you're less likely to uncover problems and issues if providers can guess when you're coming. So, Operating on weekends, evenings, or holidays. So if you have a provider who serves meals on a weekend, evenings, uh, snacks, suppers, holidays, you have to go out and monitor them. Doesn't mean every time. It's just you have to choose a reasonable amount of those that you're going and showing you're doing your best effort to monitor those um, on those not typically claimed times of day or days of the week or holidays. Um, sometimes if you got people claiming on holidays or weekends that aren't really doing what they're supposed to be doing, you just got to call their bluff on it once and they won't want to serve those, those days anymore. But as a sponsor, and I think we have a handful of you that have already done this, if you choose as a sponsor to not allow weekends 
um, or holidays, that's fine, but it needs to be in your written policy. Um, I'm not going to go over this, really. It's the household documentation form that I was talking about. Basically, if you ever need to utilize this for whatever reason, you've got something going on, like you know something's up and you're trying to reach out to make sure these kids, um, what, what their actual information is, if they actually exist, um, if you send out the household contact information or if you even contact by phone, two negative responses, um, basically, a negative or no response is a negative response, but um, if this happens, then you have to pursue further action and basically declare them SD. You have to be able at any time if you feel like you need to verify these children and their information, you should be able to. So that's the point of that. Okay, we're gonna, there's several slides on serious deficiency and we went over it in great detail the last couple of years. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna just kind of do a brief overview. Um, and we already stated this, if you do have a provider who's seriously deficient, we have to, we have to do a pre-approval of that note, any letters you send out, just because it's so specific what has to be in those letters. And so we wanna make sure it, it, they all meet regulations. So let me tell you this, like uh, we don't get, Karen, have you gotten any serious deficiency letters since you've been here? For approval? I don't think we have. If you're talking, I can't hear you. Well, anyway, um, I'm kind of surprised, and it might be just because we're not going out on site and stuff, and, and I can see that. But I just want to reiterate that you guys, it is your responsibility to make sure these providers are doing, oh, no, thank you. Um, I didn't think so. You've got to hold, you've got to make these providers honest. You've got to follow up on them and make sure they're doing what they're doing, they're supposed to be doing. And I'm not saying that to be negative. Um, it's just that when it comes down to it, you're you're responsible for their actions and it, you've got to show your due diligence to try to correct it when they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing so um say we come out we're doing a review and they're consistently having menu problems right um we're not saying just disallow every single meal always but we're saying give them some training like if they're not recording something correctly or they're claiming something that's not allowable you've got to show where you're following up and working on it if we're not saying right off the bat make them sd but we got to see that you're trying to work with them to train them to do it right for another example um if they're not home when we when you go out for a review so we experienced this on a review this year that we show up and the lady's not there and <clears throat> she claimed she had told the sponsor and this and that and it just sort of it was a snowball effect and she was very upset and was just like you can't find me not compliant for this and I'm like well we can and what we did we ended up giving her the benefit of the doubt and then we tried and we came back another day and everything was fine but apparently this my this was a consistent problem of her not being there when the sponsor showed up um, for a review, but it, it wasn't documented properly. I mean, we're not saying just go out there, oh, you're not home, you're SD, but you need to document that as a sponsor, you're, you're tracking those problems, that you're trying to work with them, so that when we come out, it's not all of a sudden, well, they're not home, and then you're going to get written up from them not being home, and you've not, I mean, do you see what I'm saying? It, it's the same thing with us, all those things that could lead to an SD. You've got to document it. When you go out and you're doing monitoring reviews, you need to document and make notes of if there's issues, write it down. Doesn't mean they have to be SD, but you need to document those issues. So when we come out, it doesn't just look like suddenly you haven't been doing what you should be doing and they're just doing whatever they want. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah, no, guys are quiet. Okay, so um, okay. So like I said, there's very specific. Is the five day on Kate Care wasn't enough? Okay. 
can we print the five day, not the child attendance reconciliation? Well, you're right. In, in kid care, it's called the child attendance reconciliation or something like that. There's a five day reconciliation report. And I don't know why they have it labeled that way because that one is not good enough. It's the one where, and I think it's the child attendance reconciliation, Denise, on kid care. It's the one where it's kind of hard to read and it's got the legend on it. I mean, it, you have to look at it to understand it. It took me a while to figure it out. So you still have to do the child attendance reconciliation, yes. And can I clarify how you want the meal analysis done during a desk review? Well, a meal analysis can't be done if you don't observe a meal, and that's part of the waiver. So if you're not doing on-site reviews, the meal, um, that's probably good. Printing both is probably good just to cover, cover your rear. But on the meal analysis, um, if you're not doing on-site meal observations, <clears throat> You can try to do, um, I have, I know some that were sending pictures. I know some that were even FaceTiming. And that's, that's great, but all not required if you're doing an offsite desk review. You can simply state on the meal analysis section that it couldn't be conducted. Um, you can record what they, they um, well, if you're doing a FaceTime, that's what they were doing. I mean, it's still kind of hard. You're still just looking and seeing and assuming it's the right serving. But if you're not even doing that, if you're just doing a total desk review, you're not contacting them during a time of a meal, you just write that you couldn't be conducted and for the waiver, it was waived. You wouldn't fill it out. But I would say do what you can to try to do some type of virtual because it's been pretty, it's been pretty neat. Some of the different, um, they've been pretty open to it from what I understand. We've been doing a lot of virtual things like that too on our side. Okay, where was I at? Serious deficiencies. Um, so anyways, it's a very specific process. I'm not saying I want you guys to go out there and find, just start writing people up, but it's peculiar that we've not had any SDs this year, and then we're going out and doing reviews and we're finding some serious issues. So I think we need to um, start training our people, and I know it's kind of tough because we're kind of hands off right now, and it might be that way again for a while. Yeah, for those, not everyone has internet or iPhones, and that's fine. And you would just write on the meal analysis, you're not able. Okay. Termination for cause. A sponsoring organization uh, must initiate action to terminate the agreement of a daycare home for cause if the sponsoring organization determines a daycare home has committed one or more serious deficiencies. Termination happens if they have been SD and they didn't fix their issue. Like once you're SD, it does not go away. And unfortunately, if they switch sponsors, which I think a lot of us, we've talked about this before and I don't necessarily think we agree with it, but that's USDA's call. It does, the serious deficiency does not follow the provider. So if they become temporarily deferred and they're with you know, ABC sponsor and then they go to one, two, three sponsor, it doesn't follow them, which kind of stinks. So now it's just the new sponsor's problem. Um, but as long as you have a provider and they've ever been SD, it doesn't matter if it was 20 years ago. If they do those things again, you propose to terminate. So that's when that happens. Like they, and it's within reason. I mean, anyway, I'm not going to go there. Here's some list of things or here's the list of serious deficiencies, um, things that could potentially lead to their termination. Submission of false information on the application, submission of false claims, if they're simultaneously operating with more than one sponsor, but kind of pretty impossible. Um, Non-compliance with meal patterns, failure to keep records, that 25% error rate. So if their claim is over 25% in error, um, they're supposed to be SD. Um, if they do anything, conduct business or, or conditions um, that threaten the health or safety of children. And it doesn't happen a lot. The few times this is ever really applicable is if they're operating and you find out their license has been revoked and they're still operating. That basically would just like cease operation then because they're just not even approved to be operating. Um, if they have any conviction indicating a lack of business in integrity, failure to participate in training, that's probably one of the ones that's the hardest. I don't know why, and maybe it's getting easier now that we have all these virtual options and you can get it done easier. 
And then basically this last one is just like anything else that has to do with something they're not doing right. Um, like I said, I, we're not encouraged, I'm not encouraging you guys to go out there and just find them, write them up. We want to make sure that they're doing things like they're supposed to be doing. There are six steps in the SD process. Uh, we got to identify the serious deficiency, and then we issue the notice of serious deficiency within 10 calendar days. So it is, it's got to be timely, or we'll be out of compliance. You'll be out of compliance, we'll be out of compliance with USD regulations. So if you have one that's SD, you need to reach out to us right away, and we need to get that notice to them within 10 calendar days. Um, once they get that, the letter will it, it, that is issued to them explains, you know, what steps they have to take to do their corrective action, and they have to submit a corrective action to you. Um, and then, then if they correct your issues, um, you'll send a notice of temporary deferral. Used to, we called it rescind, and they, like a serious deficiency rescission or something like that. But the USDA took that word away because rescind implies it goes away, and it doesn't. So that's why we have to make sure all those letters and all that verbiage now says temporarily deferred. Um, so anyway, that will happen. So at any point, they can a serious they can appeal the serious deficiency. That's not an appealable action. But if they ever have to pay money back, they can appeal that and say it's not owed or. If we propose termination and disqualification, they can appeal that. And then we issue a notice of final termination and disqualification within 10, cal 10 calendar days if the appeal is upheld or if the time frame for requesting an appeal has passed or if issue of notice of temporary deferral within 10 calendar days if the appeal is overturned. So, and that's all outlined in the appeal procedure. So, um, I don't know that any of any of you have experienced that. It's not been since I've been on, in, in the office. But like I said, we haven't had a lot of SD. I know Edgar processed several, but if at any point you have any that are SD, you just need to stop and holler at us and we'll help you through the process because we want to make sure it's right. Um, I mentioned this the imminent threat one. If at any point you encounter this in a serious deficiency that constitutes an imminent threat, you have to like stop right then and we'll follow the procedures for the suspension process. We basically just have to like stop them in their tracks. They, we have to suspend them. They can't operate anymore until the SD process has been um, completed, which is not the case for any other type of serious deficiency. Any other time they're seriously deficient, they can continue to operate. You continue to pay them throughout the process until the final outcome. If they become terminated, obviously you stop paying them, um, but otherwise you continue to pay them throughout that process. And then here are the different things this notice of serious deficiency has to include. And that's why we really just want to make sure you send it to us and we approve it and make sure it has to be in there. It has to have all the regulatory citations um, that support that, that serious deficiency. It has to tell the, age, the actions that need to be taken by the daycare home to correct their problems. It has to give them um, time to correct it. Uh, the serious deficiency determination is not subject to appeal, like I said earlier. Um, they, it also has to state that if they fail to fully and permanently correct it within the allotted time, or actually if ever, that they will be proposed for termination and disqualification. And then also, if at any point during the SD process, if someone, if they haven't corrected their action and we've temporarily deferred, if they're like, I don't want to do this anymore, I'm done, that's considered a voluntary termination and they're automatically um, terminated and they'll be put on the national disqualified list that point. Um, so this talks about the corrective action. What what does an, an acceptable corrective action or CAP as we refer to it will include? It's got to have a name of providers who were SD and meet the address and the date of birth and then the details. It has a detail um, for each serious deficiency. We need the questions of what, who, when, where, and how answered. So you know, what were the SDs and how will they be addressed? Who will address them? When will the procedures be implemented to correct SDs? Where will the CAP documentation be retained? And how will the provider ensure the CAP remains in effect? And this, what the responses they provide on these need to be very um, detailed. Okay. So once they have a successful corrective action, 
will send the notice or you will send the notice to temporarily defer that determination. Um, and it's basically just saying like, hey, it's on hold for now. You can't ever do this again. So if, like I said before, if they ever did it again, unfortunately, it would move to the next step, which would be proposed for termination. And remind them of that. And then we, like everything else, we need a copy of that notice. So here's reasons why a corrective action could be deemed unsuccessful. When they submit a cap to you, you don't just have to take it. You can tell them like, no, this isn't good enough, or this isn't a good enough response, or I need more um, information. It's up to you to make sure that your cap is acceptable. Um, and it's gotta be to you by the deadline, just not postmarked by the deadline. And this goes into the notice of proposed termination and disqualification, um, and I've kind of already gone on about that, but that comes after they've, they have not fully and permanently cor corrected their actions. And there's a ton of other letters that can come depending on how um, the SB progresses. Um, they can appeal, there's letters, specific letters for whether they appeal or not, or if they do appeal, if we win or if they win. So um, that's why we just ask you to reach out to us when you have an SB provider. Um, Stated this already, serious deficiencies cannot be appealed. The overclaim and the proposed termination can though. So if you say they owe money, they can, they can appeal that. Or if you propose one, they can appeal that. And you have to make sure you have appeal procedures um, included with every one of those letters that go out. And you should have appeal procedures. If you don't, you're in our um, resource library. Just take those and put your name on it because they, they can't change from that. Those are regulatory. And then, unfortunately, in the event somebody becomes terminated, they are placed on the NDL by us. Um, there is a specific form you have to complete that has that information that what will need to be sent to us for us to report that to the NDL. They remain on the NDL for seven years or longer if they still owe a debt. And we just recently had one that encountered this. It's not often, but um, it's weird. I don't know why, but whenever um, they come off the NDL, they're actually on the NDL still, but it just says remove. So if you ever encounter that, if it says remove, I don't know why they don't just take them off rather than leave them on there and say remove. But if it says remove, they're good to go. It's, they've, they've done their time and they are good to go. So briefly on the current and active waivers we have in place, um, a lot of these haven't really affected you guys so much because the main thing that's affected you all through COVID is that our numbers have dropped drastically. And I think hopefully we're back on the incline, I hope. Um, but these are all still available. They all do require um, some type of approval from consultants or us. If you have any providers who want to operate or serve meals in any way other than at their home and on site, it's got to be approved first. So um, we have the non-congregate um, waiver that these are all extended through June 30th. That's the one that allows like the grab and go type of meals. And I really just don't, I think we had one provider out of all of you guys last year that even said they wanted to do that. And I don't even think they ended up doing it. I could be wrong. Um, we also have the ability for them to do parent pickup. So say they have an enrolled child, but they're home quarantined and they wanted to provide those meals. The parents come pick up the meal and do that. But like I said, I have had pre-approval, but I just, we didn't have any family daycare homes that utilized any of these last year. Or if they did, you didn't let us know. So I'm hoping they didn't. Um, then we have an area eligibility, which we've already talked about more than once. The meal time flexibility, which um, basically just got rid of the restriction of having to serve meals spaced out at certain times. So, you know, schools are passing out meals. They were doing, set, you know, five or seven days worth at one time. All of these waivers is what was allowing that to happen, to be served off site all together and parents could pick them up. Um, with all that said, I really ask you guys to be vigilant about keeping your eyes open when you see something that appears to be um, a meal that may have come from a school, because usually they're kind of pretty easily, more easily identifiable, especially if it's accompanying with like a pint of milk. But those pints of milk, you can't just go to the store and buy. Those are coming from food service companies. Make sure your providers know that if they're going and getting free meals from schools or other um, nonprofit institutions, which is great because it's helping our other programs, they can't claim them. Um, I can't even 
begin to fathom the amount of that that's happening. But just make sure they understand that if they're going to take advantage of those, which is great, they cannot be reimbursed for it. There's also a meal pattern flexibility waiver that's available nas nationally, but Oklahoma did not opt into this waiver. We have provided training and training and training on all these new meal, meal, new meal patterns that came out in 17. Um, so we, we did not opt into it. So meal patterns must be met no matter what. And then the on-site monitoring waiver, and we've already talked about this one, but it's extended 30 days after the end of public health emergency. And we'll have you guys fill out another one of those at that time. Okay. So now we're on to meal patterns, unless you guys have any questions about anything else before. Sorry. Getting click happy. Okay. So, like I said just a second ago, we had the new meal patterns that came out in 17. We've had a grace period um, as a state agency, which is part of why we decided to not opt in to the flexibility, meal patterns flexibility, because we've been flexible for three years. We've allowed a grace period for everyone. So if you didn't meet the meal patterns or your providers didn't meet the meal patterns, we didn't disallow meals. We would have found you non-compliant, but we wouldn't have reclaimed those meals. That has changed now, and some of you have been reviewed and experienced that. Um, so make sure that all your, your menus are meeting meal patterns. Or you shouldn't pay. So briefly, we'll go over some of those changes, and then we'll kind of talk about some of those issues that we've been noticing on reviews. Um, we'll, somebody just asked Denise. We'll talk about that at the very end. Uh, okay. Water. So water is is very important. It's got to be offered and made available throughout the day, but it's not a component. And you guys know that. But many times we see um, those recorded on menus and stuff, and it's really not necessary. Um, it has to be available. It's required by DHS. But now it's just part of our meal patterns. I mean, it was part of those meal pattern changes. It's just not credible. So don't have, make sure they're not recording it. We see that on menus, and they just shouldn't even be recording it. You would think that it would, wouldn't have to be part of that meal pattern change to have them provide water. For breakfast, you have to serve milk, a fruit or vegetable, and a grain. And then your grain can be substituted with the meat up to three times per week. So that was one of the changes. Lunch and supper has to have um, all five components, basically, a milk, milk, meat or meat alternate, alternate, vegetable, fruit, and a grain. The one change they did make, you know, used to fruit and vegetable was together, and with these meal patterns, they broke apart, broke apart fruit and vegetable. But then after that commenting period that they always have when they have changes, um, they came back and said that you can serve two vegetables um, in, in lieu of a vegetable and a fruit. So basically, you just can't serve two fruits. And then your snack is a, is a selection of the two, a selection, two of the five components. So two of what you see here. So a little bit about milk. Um, One-year-olds can have unflavored whole milk. Two to five is unflavored fat-free or skim milk and unflavored 1%. Six to 12 and 13 to 18 years um, have, can have unflavored fat-free or low-fat, flavored fat-free or low-fat 1% milk. So you can't serve flavored milk until they're six. <clears throat> and then they also added that new age group, 13 to 18 years. Um, we didn't have that before, but we do now. So some important things to remember, you know, never guess the number of ounces of milk being poured. And remind them to use proper measuring cups, you know, a liquid cup that's different than a dry cup. Don't use the eight, eight ounce cup when the serving size is eight ounce cup. You know, that's just setting the kid up to make a giant mess. So, we'll, you know. Those are helpful um, tips to remind them of. You can always have them use a permanent marker and mark the lines on their cups. So they're always having to measure it out too. Breast 
milk past the age of one is allowable. Um, <clears throat> it allows you to claim reimbursement when a mother chooses to breastfeed in the facility or if it's expressed and fed to them um, for children even past the age of one, like I said. So we've had, we always have questions about this. And like if, and I think that's the next slide. What's somewhere on how you record it. If the mother comes on site and, and breastfeeds, you can, you can count that and you just record it as breastfed on site or whatever. There's no way you can really record the amount that was fed to the child. You just assume they got enough. Um, whereas the expressed milk, obviously you can measure out and record how much. And then it also can be served in, when it's expressed, it can be served in combination with other milk types to meet the um, minimum. There is a trans transition period. When a child turns two, they're required to be served low fat or fat free milk unless there's a special dietary need. So um, they have to switch over, but then immediate switch from whole milk to low fat or fat free can be hard sometimes. Sometimes they just don't want it. So um, the updated meal patterns as you know, allow for a one month transition period to accommodate that. So you can, you know, mix the milk as they're switching. Milk substitutions. Um, any institution can allow parents to request a milk substitution if they choose to. Uh, it is up to the provider's discretion whether or not they want to accommodate any special requests for milk that are just for preferences. But if it's for a medical reason, it has to be it has to be um, supplied, and the medical statement must you know must be on form. I mean on file. But like it says here, the medical statement is not required if the substitution is nutritionally equivalent equivalent to cow's milk. So if there's a substitution like a soy milk, you don't necessarily have to have the medical statement because it's equivalent. Um, but you have to make sure that they are using those equivalents. And there's like the Great Value brand, the Eighth Continent. There's a few brands that um, are that meet the equivalent. But just for request, if they want to accommodate that, a request must be um, in in writing, and it has to detail what they're asking for. But it still has to be equivalent to cow's milk, whatever they're requesting. So sometimes it's hard to accommodate those. Like I said, it's, it's at the option and the cost of the institution whether they want to do that. The only time they have to do it is if it's a um, medical reason. Here is the requirements for it to be considered an equivalent. Milk substitution. So a medical statement is required when a disability requires a non-dairy beverage that is not nutritionally equivalent to cow's milk. So this is the only exception when a milk is allowed when it's not equivalent or if it's just said not to be served altogether, um, but a medical statement must be on file. It's gotta be signed by a recognized medical authority. Um, it should, any for any medical statement, it should include some recommended alternate foods or substitutions for whatever can't be served. Um, you can't claim meals lacking required components quantities unless a meal is supported by a medical statement. And you may not make non-medical substitutions when doc with documentation. <clears throat> Any questions on medical statements? Okay. So meat, meat alternates. Just briefly about going over the changes that came with 2017 um, updated meal patterns. Meat, meat alternates. Um, may be served in place of entire grains component at bre breakfast, maximum of three times per week. Tofu now credits as a meat alternative and yogurt, including soy yogurt credits as a meat alternate. But remember they've got those um, sugar restrictions. Some have lots of sugar and some not so much, but no more than 23 grams per, per six ounces. And this applies to all eight groups in the CACFP. Your vegetable and fruit component, some important, important things to remember about that. There are now two separate components for lunch and supper and snack, but um, they're the same, they're still the same thing at breakfast. It's, for breakfast, it's that fruit or vegetable requirement. 
Juice is now limited to once per day. And as I mentioned earlier, a vegetable can replace the fruit, the fruit component at lunch or supper. The meal pattern, and this is just reiterating what I just said, um, allows a vegetable to be used to meet the entire fruit component for lunch or supper. For example, during lunch, a, a serving of broccoli and a serving of carrots would be a reimbursable meal. This means a lunch or dinner can include a vegetable and fruit or two vegetables. However, two fruits are not credible. And like I said before, juice can only be served once per day. And if it's a fruit juice blend, whatever, whichever one has the most of it is what you would um, be, um, would be the one that contributes the, whichever one contributes, contributes more, it would be what you write it up at. So if it has more carrot juice, the vegetable, vice versa. And then our grain. So now at least one serving of grain must be whole grain rich per day. All other grains must be with, made with enriched or whole grain meal or flour. Breakfast cereal must contain no more than six grams of sugar per dry ounce. And grain-based desserts are no longer creditable. So how do you determine what whole grain rich is? Um, whole grain rich foods are those that contain 100% whole grains or at least 50% whole grains and the remaining grains of the food are enriched. A good thing to go by, WIC has a lot of different, they have a approved whole grain list, they have approved yogurt list, they have approved cereal list. I would encourage you to look those up and utilize those. And um, you can also use a rule of three, which is a little confusing because there's really, it's kind of two, but um, the rule of three is basically the first ingredient or the second after water must be whole grain. And then the next two ingredients, if there are any, must be a whole grain and rich grain or those others listed. And there's a whole list of other types of grains that count. So any questions on whole grains? We sent you guys the crediting handbook a few weeks ago and we had, had a few questions that came back and one of them was about whole grain. Breakfast cereal. So now you know that we have to make sure that they're not ha they don't have cereals that have more than um, six grams of sugar per dry ounce. So, like I said, WIC also has their approved list that's um, good to go by. But make sure that they're not counting those things or they're not serving those things. Yes, they can serve them, but it would be an extra. So it'd just be best to say they're not allowed altogether. Here's where you can find those WIC approved breakfast cereal list and, and a ton of other, but just Google it. Just Google Oklahoma WIC food list and it'll come up as an example. It's a bad picture. Um, as I said before, grain-based desserts are not allowed. Um, that would be pop tarts, cookies, granola bars, all those things. You guys know that. They can serve it as extras, but just tell them not to record it altogether. If it's an extra, we don't need to know about it. Here's those examples. Toaster pastries, which would be a Pop-Tart, granola bars, sweet pie crust. You know, and that's kind of controversial because you could use the same pie crust to make a savory pie, like a chicken pot pie, but the same pie crust used to make a peach pie is not creditable. It all has to go back to the sugar content and something and whether or not it's allowable. Grain-based desserts um, are allowed and they can be used for special occasions. Um, they should be served as an additional item only. And like I said, you really should just encourage them not to even record it. We don't really need to know about it. Food crediting information. So when you, any of those items that you guys are allowing them to use that are combination items or highly processed items, They've got to be accompanied with some type of crediting information that tells us that it's um, what it is and how much it needs to be served to meet the to meet the amount required. And that's where we're having some issues. And I'm probably I'm skip ahead a little. I'm skipping ahead a little bit. But um, those kind of items are going to be like chicken nuggets, uh, 
corn dogs, fish sticks, that's what always comes to mind, right, for all of us, and that's what we're used to. But what we're seeing more of being used and it's not being supported by this label, things like lunch meat and smoked sausages or hot dogs that meet the requirements, things like that. Um, any CN labels, and I've deleted a lot, there was a ton of slides about CN labels that we've gone over and over every year, but the main gist of CN labels is you've got to make sure that if they're using a CN label product that you have the copy of the CN label and that that's what they're actually serving because it's specific to that product and you'd be surprised how many are surprised that, you know, a state fair corn dog label isn't going to work for a foster farm corn dog. It's very much different. So you've got to make sure they're really serving the products that they have a label for, um, that you have it on file, and that it's still a valid and current CN label. And the way that you can check that is by going to this website. And we did that last year and showed you guys. And it's still the same thing. You can go there, look it up, and it tells you if it's it's got the label number, the CN label number, and I'll skip ahead here. See here it says 024569. That's the product, um, oh no, I just told you wrong. And that in here in the CN label, you can't really read it. I think it's like 094, I don't know, I can't see, my eyes aren't very good, but there's always a, a CN number inside the CN label area, usually on the top right corner, it'll give you the CN number. That's the number that you go by to when you go on that website to look it up to see if it's still, um, an active good label. If it's not on that big giant list of CN labels, it's not currently an active CN label and you can't use that to credit anything. So I know we've gone back and forth for years, whether it has to be on the package or if it can be a copy, it really doesn't matter. Um, as long as we have the information, we know that it's a current CN label, it gives us all the crediting information, it's legible, um, and then it matches the product that we're serving. That's the importance of the CN label because it's telling us how much to serve of each product. So like for this one, the corn dog here, it says each four ounce corn dog provides two ounce equivalent meat, meat alternate, and two ounce equivalent grains for child nutrition meal pattern. And then it um, has your um, number here. You can look it up and all that. And these are probably incredibly old labels. It may not even still be good, but if you were to go and look it up you could, on that list, you could find whether or not they were. And really, though, these aren't the issues we're having. More or less, we're having we're having folks have CN labels on file, and they're legitimate CN labels. But two things we're having problems with: that's not what they're really serving when we go out and and observe meals, um, or it's other things that we're just missing identifying information on. No, it, do, it doesn't have to be an original copy. Somebody asked me directly if, if the CN label has to be an original copy. No, we don't, we don't want you to have to maintain like the cutout boxes or packages. It can be a photocopy. It just got to be legible so we can see all that information. And we have lots of products that say this little say, saying with the box around it says it's approved for child nutrition. That's not a label. So make sure they understand that. It's still pretty hard to find items with CN labels on it right now. They're, they're, they're starting to come back out. You see you can find them on all, all types of stuff. Um, I'm taking CN labels away and having providers serve another protein and bread along with it. Um, that, that's a good plan because right now they're, they're harder to find. Um, they got to serve more of it and it's just one extra thing you have to keep up with. You're right. Someone else messaged me and said, um, the date on that corn dog scene label is 513, it's too old. Probably. Um, that date is not an expiration date. It's a date that the, um, I'm going ahead. It's a date when it, it, the label was created, basically. And typically, I need to enter here. Sometimes I'm just making stuff up when we're doing these trainings and I'm waiting for him to tell me if I'm right or wrong. Karen, you may know. In the last three or five years, I can't remember. But that's the purpose of looking well on that website because if they're expired, they won't be on that list anymore. So I wouldn't really pay any attention to that date. I would go look at the list and see if that label number is still accurate. 
Where was I? Okay. Um, in the event that you can't get a, a CN label, there are manufacturers that you can reach out to them directly and ask for a product formulation statement, and sometimes they'll provide it. I and mean, then sometimes you're going to need it on items that we're going to talk about here in a minute that aren't your typical things you think of when it comes to CN labels. Um, but you can um, contact the, the manufacturer directly. It's got to be on their letterhead and it's going to provide the same crediting information. It's based on the food buying guide. It's going to read a lot like what your CN label does. It's just not an actual label on a package, but it's got to come actually from the manufacturer um, with a crediting statement. It's got to be signed and dated by a legal authorized person of that company. That and it can be used in lieu of a label. So, like I said, I think we really need to start. If you guys aren't using the food buying guide and that crediting handbook we sent you um, in the attachment, I emailed you guys late last night. The food buying guide is in there. It's a bunch of pages. We also have it in our resource library. And I know customarily we're not, we don't use it. Um, but we need to learn to because this is what we're having to refer to. Um, hold on a second. Tony just asked me, so if the label numbers are correct, the date doesn't matter. No, no. Pretty much, yeah. If the, the point of being able to go and look it up on that list is if it's in there, um, if the same CN number matches what's on that list and it gives you the same crediting information, then it's fine. The date doesn't necessarily matter. The date, we were stuck... At one point, we were told to get rid of anything prior. I can't remember that date. I want to say it was like 2012 or it was 2014. I don't know. I'm making it up at this point. But at some point, they were like, they told us, and it was when I was still at a sponsor, CN labels went out the window, and I think it was 2012. Anything older than that, we had to get rid of. Um, but really, the date isn't so much important as if we're looking it up to see if it still has the same crediting information and it actually exists. No. Okay, so anyway, back to what I was saying. You guys really need to register for that food buying guide training on August 5th. Because this is what we rely on, that and the crediting handbook, to make sure that what you're allowing your providers to claim and what you're paying them for is a creditable food item. And we're finding that more times than not, we're allowing, you guys are allowing things that are not creditable. And I know there's been lots of back and forth about lunch meats and things like that, um, and things have changed. I can remember way back when we were told that don't go, don't go buy deli lunch meat. Deli, if you get it cut at the deli, it doesn't count. And then we were told, no, that's the only thing you can use. That is, that is the right thing to buy. It's just, it's been confusing. And so what we're doing and what we're making sure all our institutions know that when it comes down to knowing what's creditable, we have the food buying guide and we have that crediting handbook and those are like our Bibles. And so if it's not in either one of those, it's not an allowable food. And what we're finding when we're referring back to that, if it's not in there and it's not supported with a label that tells us what it is, we're having to disallow it. Um, and so I, I'm, like I said, I'm really kind of sad that we can't do this in person and um, because I really want to do some activities where we could thumb through the book and have some examples of food items and that you can go find it. But for a good one, if you're able to open up that food buying guide, food buying guide also has a really cool app. Put it on your phone. If you're out on a monitoring review and you don't know if this food item there, you know, got written down on their meat, counts as a meat, you can just search it up. It'll tell you, it'll tell you what category it falls in. It'll tell you exactly how much of that product that needs to be served to meet requirement because just because you know I mean it even gives detailed information like um, they serve chicken legs right well chicken legs are meat but how many chicken legs do you know need to be served to meet the requirement of the, you know an ounce or two ounces without having to pick it off the bone the point of the food buying guide is that everything in there has a standard of identity and so if it's called a chicken leg and it's got skin and da 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 da, it's precise, you know, approximately this much. I mean, that's how detailed it is, how big it is, how many, whether it has bones or not. It'll tell you one chicken leg equals this. And generally, and I use that as an example because that's something we see a lot. Most times they're not serving enough. One chicken leg's not enough because it's mostly bone and skin. The 
but that food buying guide is going to tell you exactly how much needs to be served because one chicken, one chicken leg, USDA has created a standard of identity that will tell you on average one will equal this. Make any sense? I know I'm just sort of all over the place, but chicken legs really, really aren't our issue. Our issue basically is with our lunch meats, our cheeses, our combination items, hot dogs, smoked sausages, like little smokies. Um, those are really our, the, the problems we're seeing. So if you're allowing turkey lunch meat um, and you're paying them for those meals, that's a turkey sandwich, a turkey and cheese sandwich, and that's all that's written on the menu. Unfortunately, that's not a creditable meal without proper documentation because there, turkey, there is no turkey lunch meat in the food buying guide. If you go and search in that food buying guide, you're not going to find, oh, darn it, sorry. You're not going to find turkey in there. You will find turkey ham. And that is oddly, it's a more, it's a process, but it does have a standard of identity, and it will tell you exactly that um, the product, if it's called turkey ham, it, it's not going to need a CN label or any type of special product formulation statement because it has a standard of identity and it's in that food buying guide, and it tells you exactly what it is. Turkey lunch meat is not. The only time turkey is creditable is if somebody bakes a whole turkey and carves it and serves it that way. That's the only time turkey is going to be creditable. I don't think a lot of providers are baking turkeys and making sandwiches. You might have some. Same thing goes for your ham. We're seeing so much ham and turkey lunch meat and chicken lunch meat and things like that, and they're just not creditable items. Um, now, the only, the only the ham, if you go and look in the food buying guide, and I'm just assuming maybe you guys are able to sum to it right now in the meat section while I'm talking about this, but you will find ham. But it's not the ham that you find in the deli selection or the deli section of the store. That's talking about a ham you're going to bake. And it's got to be called mild cured. That's got to be the description of it. And most of your deli ham meats are like, they say, um, gosh, I don't even want to make stuff up because then I'm going to say something wrong. But if it doesn't say mild cured on the package, it doesn't count. And there's not a ham that does. There's just not, unless you're baking a ham and slicing it and serving it like that. However, um, you might find some creditable hams in the deli section, and you would have to go to the deli section, like where they actually slice it themselves. Sometimes they do, but you have to get a copy of that label, um, which is going to be hard to come by. So. Our suggestion to you guys is if you're going to allow them to serve lunch meat, they need to serve turkey ham because that is a credible item and it is easily, you can find it. Um, or they need to serve enough cheese that it, and it needs to be documented that it's 100% cheese because then we get into the problem with not all our cheeses are created equally. You know, our individually sliced cheeses that are wrapped. Those aren't, those are not going to generally be creditable. They're not real cheese. Or if they are, you have to serve twice as much and you'll see the information I'm telling you that I'm rattling off that's all in that food buying guide it tells you that so if you're you have cycle menus or menus that are coming in and they're recording those food items right off the bat I mean with July's claim they're about to start coming in you guys need to make sure you are disallowing those meals that ha include those things if you don't know that they're creditable so if it's a ham and cheese sandwich we, we can't allow that with proper documentation. We right off the bat know ham alone doesn't count unless they're baking a ham. And in that case, they should put baked ham on the menu. Or if it's 100% cheese without them saying 100% cheese. Um, gosh, uh, I, it's doubtful that we could get the food buying guide printed for everyone. I mean, we're talking like 1,200 providers. It's unlikely. But um, what we're working on, the crediting handbook maybe, but what I would suggest to you and what we're working on with another group is to make some cheat sheets that will be especially help, helpful, helpful for providers because like with our centers, 
a lot of that food buying guide is talking about number 10 cans of stuff. I mean, when we get outside of the meat section, there, it's talking about large quantities of stuff that our family daycare homes aren't buying. They're not buying in large quantities because they don't need it. So I think we're trying to create some cheat sheets that can kind of hone into those things, especially our food or meat items that can just be some handouts that we can provide so that they know, okay, if I want to serve a sandwich, this is exactly what I have to serve and this is how much, and this is what's creditable. And I, and I think once we can get those created, that's going to be more helpful. This, if you gave them this food buying guide, they it would just blow their mind. Yeah, and I would suggest you guys go ahead. You're right. When things get too complicated, they just get overwhelmed and they're just like to heck with it. And then they just serve whatever they want anyway. You guys make some cheat sheets. That's why you really should come to that food buying guide class. Um, get some ideas of what you will allow and make them a cheat sheet. Make it based on what your people are already serving. If you've got a lot of people serving cold sandwiches, give them a cheat sheet of what would count as a cold what what counts because they need to be recording if it's a turkey ham and 100 percent cheese um, sandwich that's what their menu needs to say when they're recording it and so some of it some of it we're having issues and i'm going to kind of go into the next thing about our combination items we've also had instances when we've had to disallow meals like a, a, a casserole type of meal or spaghetti or a pizza or chicken and noodles um when it it just says pizza. Well, that tells us, okay, either it's homemade or it needs a CN label. But that menu didn't say either. So how do we know enough was there? How do we know what, what are we going on to know that it was a creditable item? So we've got an issue now of they're also not recording properly because if it's homemade, they need to make that distinction on the menu when they record it. I mean, you know, it's homemade pizza and really it shouldn't even be written that way. It should be, you know, whole grain pizza crust and hamburger meat, I don't know, or ground beef, you know what I'm saying? So when we see stuff like pizza or any kind of combination thing, we gotta know if it's homemade and then we need to know the recipe or what was in it, or we're gonna have the CN label. So not only have we have an issue of we need to train with a credible food item, we need to make sure they're recording it correctly. Um, hot dogs, that's the same thing. If you just record hot dogs, if you look in that food buying guide in the meat section, there is no word in there called hot dog. We can't, we cannot allow a meal to be paid for a hot dog because hot dogs don't count. They don't have a standard of identity, but a beef frank does. And those 100% beef franks are creditable. And so it needs to be recorded as a beef frame. Um, smoked sausage, and, and the example of that's Little Smokies, we see that served a lot. Little Smokies can't be served without a CN label. They're not in the food buying guide. So you have to have a CN label. There actually is, though, that Eckridge, maybe it's not Eckridge Farms, maybe it is the Little Smokies brand, that they actually have one called Little Beef Frank now. And so that would count, even though little beef frank isn't in, in there. It's still called a beef frank. So it's using, it's, it's still creditable because it's called a beef frank. It's just a little one. Um, that's the point of the food buying guide is to make sure that it's a creditable food item. Um, there is a section though that's kind of misleading. I don't even know why they have that section. I guess it's just for us to know that other foods if anything falls in other foods, it's not a creditable item. It just means it's something else, but it doesn't count as these other things. So anything that you find in that hand handbook that's in the other food section, it doesn't count. And I don't have it open in front of me. I can't even give you a good example, but just know that if it's in the other foods, it doesn't count. But I would start with um, printing some, make, go ahead and make them some copies from that crediting handbook because there's some pages that's just got the charts where it, you can go and find, go to the meat section and go to bacon and it'll just say yes, no, or maybe. And that that is just clear as mud there, it'll tell you. And that would be the most helpful to provide to your providers right now until we could get some better cheat sheets. Like I said, we, we have a separate group that's working with us that we're contracted with to make us some, but especially just the meat section that would be an easy few pages you could print and give to them now and a good place to start 
Um, then it goes on to talk about your whole grains and yogurt and cereal. Um, how are you ensuring? How are you ensuring that when you're reviewing these um, claims every month, that those items are creditable? Because we're not able to, when we come out there um, and we're looking at your your claims that you've already paid with homemade yogurt count. Um, gosh, like they're making yogurt from scratch. I'm going to say probably not unless they have a recipe that can show us how much sugar is in it. And I guess they could ask them for a recipe and send it to me. Y'all got me intrigued now. Now I want to make yogurt. Um, Kim, if you can ask them to send a recipe to me. Yeah. I, I don't see why if we have a recipe, we couldn't. Yeah, let me go. We'll figure something out. That's interesting. But like I started to say, if um, how, are, how are you guys ensuring that every time you're reading a menu, it's a creditable item? I know at some point we're just taking their word for it. Right, you'd have to be there every meal to make sure it's, so, it's creditable, which is impossible. But we're gonna have to do a better job of doing our part to try. Um, because, I mean, you guys know as well as I do, they're on the up and up and serving what they're supposed to when we show up. We've seen it, we've seen it before when we show up for a meal review and they've got pizza rolls that they just cooked and now they're scrambling to get something else made because they know pizza rolls don't count and they weren't expecting us to come. It happens, we get it. We've got to start somewhere. And so, hold on a second. I keep having to tell my dog to hush. She's snoring so loud. That's why I keep pausing, sorry. Okay, so, it's going to be impossible to always make sure every meal is creditable, but we've got to do our part. So it's really up to you guys if you want to do cycle menus or not. I think they're a very helpful tool, but they're optional, so it's up to you. But regardless of whether or not you guys have cycle menus, we're going to have to make you guys have labels and copies of stuff in their files at all times. And then you guys are going to have to make sure when you're going out on reviews that that's what they're actually serving. Okay, so how do you know that the bread they marked as whole grain was whole grain, other than they're just saying it's whole grain? We need a copy of, of whatever brand they're using. And I know this sounds tedious, but we don't know a better way to do this. So like I said, whether you're using a cycle menu or not, I mean, the cycle menu needs to, to to put brand names, it needs to be meticulous. It needs to say, you know, Sara Lee, whatever, whole grain, whatever bread. I know that sounds really picky, um, or if even it's just great value, whole grain bread, you've got to have it documented somewhere. Um, if you don't have a cycle menu, then you're going to have to have a label. You need something to know what you're looking for and that you know, they said they served this whole grain bread, by gosh, that's what they should be serving. And then when you're going out on a monitoring review, you should be seeing that that's what they have in their kitchen. You know, and I know that really just sounds like too much, but we're at that point where we're having to do that because it's different with centers. We have to look at, we look at their receipts. We look at what they actually purchased. And that's how we ensure that what they do, and we'll look at them for the entire, entire fiscal year if we see discrepancies for the review month. But we don't do that with family daycare homes. We just pay them the money and they're supposed to follow the meal patterns, but we've got to make sure they're following them. And what we're finding is they're really not. And so we are having to implement some more strict rules and guidelines to do that. So, like I said, you guys decide as a sponsor whether or not you want to require a cycle menu or not. It's not up to the provider. If you require them, that's great. They need to be super detailed. If they're going to have pizza and it's homemade, it needs to say homemade and it needs to say the crust and it needs to say the, you know, the marinara even counts as a component and your meat or cheese or what have you. And your cheese needs to say it's 100% cheddar cheese because that tells us what, you know, what it is. And the one good thing about having the cycle menus is that 
when we're looking at a claim and we're doing a review, if it just says cheese, right, we'll refer back to the cycle menu. And if the cycle menu says 100% cheddar cheese, now we just know the provider, okay, did the provider not claim 100% cheddar cheese? Or are they just being lazy and not writing it down? Because those are two separate issues, you know? First time it happens, you need to be like, you're not recording what's approved on your cycle menu. Are you not serving the right kind of cheese? Or are you just being lazy and not recording it? Like, we've got to make sure they're being very specific. Um, but back to like the things like our turkey lunch meat and our turkey ham and ham and all of that, you've got to have copies of all that in their file because that's the best we can do to make sure it's a creditable item. And so when we come and we see you've paid, we're not asking for them to spend it every month. It's just they need to find the products they want to serve and stick with them. And then if they change, they need to send you a new copy of a label or something. It doesn't have to be original. We don't want you keeping all those food containers and boxes and stuff. Um, it just needs to be copies of it. And then, like I said, we need to see you following up on it when you're going out on monitoring reviews. If they say they're using steak or corn dogs, and that's the CN label you have on file for it, when you go out and even if they're not serving corn dogs, ask about it. Look through their look through their menus through the month and be like, oh, I see that you said you served this. Do you have that so I can see it? Same thing, you know, you should be doing that on their cereals and their yogurt while you're out there too, because they might not be serving those things when you're there. But if they've been being paid for it, at some point you need to be validating that it's a creditable item. Does that make sense? It is forcing you guys to have to collect more information, but it's only to ensure that what they're serving, and it's still only as good as what the piece of paper it comes in on. We still got to make sure we're following up with it. That doesn't mean every other day that we're not there, they're going to serve whatever they want. But it's going to show our, our best effort to make sure that their, um, their menus and what we're paying them for are creditable items. Have I lost you guys? Any questions? Yay. So I hope everybody's understanding that I'm not getting any questions because I've, that's something that the consultants are going to be made aware of and that we will be looking for to be on file. Um, because we've already experienced several reviews where we've had to disallow meals because we just couldn't determine if those products were creditable because they either the, the um, information written on the claim was not a, an item that was creditable because hot dogs, for example, is not in the food buying guide and we didn't have proof that it was a beef rank that was 100% beef, but it had you had that documented somehow, we wouldn't have had to disallow it. That's I mean, that's unfortunately what's happening. Karen, do you have anything to add? And I think we have, I think we have some consultants on maybe if anyone has anything to add on that. Okay. We really do, and I, you guys that have kid care, you're really going to have you need to print that list of your, your food list and really um, make some adjustments. Adjustments, Yeah, I think you should add 100 percent. You should add as much detail as you can on your kit here and you need to eliminate stuff that's not allowable because we've had some instances where we had folks that were on kit care and it had turkey lunch meat and cereals that didn't count. You need to go over that list and just eliminate those things that so they can't even select it. Make sure hot dog says beef ranks and things like that. Or, you know, on cheese, if it says cheddar cheese, that's 100% cheese. When we're talking about cheeses and we need to know it's 100%, we're really kind of talking about your sliced American cheese. Those are the ones that are questionable, but you can never have too much, too much information. Okay, I'm gonna move on if we don't have any more questions. Okay, so infant meal patterns. Um, it broke up the age groups, like, you know, we used to have three and now there's just two. Uh, it also makes it where the meals are reimbursable when the 
another breast feeds on site. And then also it just basically provides more nutritious um, and meals and promotes the developmentally of healthy eating habits as they're developmentally ready, basically. It cut out juice, doesn't allow juice anymore. Um, introduced, instead of just, I think it used to just be the egg yolks, but now the whole yolk and, or the whole egg is an allowable meat. Yogurt's allowable for infants now. So breast milk is an optimal source of nutrients for infants, obviously. And it provides, you know, the right balance of proteins and fats and vitamins and all that. And it's allowable for any age, any age. But that's all that's required, breast milk or formula. Really, that's all that's required for all the infants now. The big take on this one is to make sure that as they're aging, that it's, we're um, making sure that the other foods are being introduced as the child's developmentally ready. Before they were introduced at four months and now it's delayed until six months, but it's those additional things are all optional. And it really does, it also allows, not only is it delaying the introduction of the solid foods so that the children are ready, but it's also allowing flexibility um, for parents that have other preferences to delay it. Um, infant milk patterns allows more nutritious foods now, like I said, specifically foods from all the food components may be served to infants around six months as it's developmentally appropriate. Um, so during breakfast, lunch, and supper meals, the following three food components must be offered to infants when they're developmentally ready. Breast milk and, or iron fortified infant formula, infant cereal, meat, meat alternate, or a combination of the two. Um, fruit, vegetable, or a combination of both. And then during snacks, there are three food components, breast milk or iron fortified formula, grains, and the vegetable fruit or a combination. So you'll see that grains and are at your snack, and that would include like your ready to eat cereals like Cheerios and things like that. We already talked about this. Oh, I knew it said it's on here somewhere. So this is not new. Um, this we've been teaching this. This thing why it's been in here since 17. So a child can be claimed if it's if they are breastfed on site. Um, you don't have to record the total amount of mother, mother breastfeeds because there's really no way for us to know. And the appropriate way to document that is to say breastfed on site or mother on site. When serving formula, some infants. Um, may not consume the entire serving, but as long as you offer the minimum amount, the meal is reimbursable. So um, this is true for any food or beverage served to all participants. It has to be offered. They don't have to consume it, but as long as it's offered and served, it's a, it, it, you can claim the meal. A participant does not need to consume the minimum serving size of a component for it to be deemed reimbursable. Any leftovers should be properly stored based on your local and health local health and safety requirements. So we've had to ask before about, you know, if a um, bottle is not finished, can they save it? And that's all up to DHS and their uh, requirements. Juice has now been eliminated. It's not creditable for infants. And then like I mentioned before, the new meal patterns um, accommodate, um, you know, preferences from parents. So if a parent wishes to not introduce solids to their children, until they're one, that's fine. Even if the child's developmentally ready, if that's what the parent prefers, um, we just need a written statement that states that, and that's why that child would be on, only be served um, the breast milk or in, um, formula. We do start asking questions though, because if those written statements aren't on file and we're out doing a review and we're looking at an infant menu and we have, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11 month old, and it's just breast milk or formula written, and that's it. We gotta ask some questions. Like, why is that, why, there's no written statement that have a preference. There's no documented medical need. Why aren't we recording these other food components? Because that child is obviously developmentally ready, unless otherwise noted. Um, and many times it just comes down to, I think um, folks, I mean, we've seen that on the center side too. They're just being lazy. They're just not recording it because all that's absolutely required is the formula or breast milk for it to be creditable, but 
That's not necessarily true. It's required those other comp components if they're developmentally re ready, otherwise documented. So stress that to your providers. Um, parents and guardians may provide one creditable food component for a reimbursable meal. This actually holds true for all ages. Um, and that kind of came with the new meal patterns. Um, so breast milk or formula, whatever the one component is, then the provider has to provide all the rest. But that's the same thing for you know any any age child. So that kind of provides a little bit of flexibility for if you say you have a provider who has a child who they don't eat a certain meat. And the parent could bring that meat for that meal or something and it could be substituted. I mean, those are instances where a parent can put, supply one component as long as the provider is supplying everything else, they can claim it. Yes, it, it, a, a parent, a mother can breastfeed their child, her child, as long as she wants and it's still creditable. That is true. It's just kind of um, when you're once they get past one year old, the way you know the way your menus are recorded, it looks like they're having milk. I mean, I would just make a note if that's really happening. There's and I still make a side note somewhere because when you have all your over your regular kids over one recorded on one menu, which is how we do it, it just looks like they're having milk. So just have them make a note somewhere. I mentioned this already. So for your snacks only, can the gra grains, bread, bread cracker, ready to eat cereal um, can be served, well, be counted toward a credible meal for infants. And you're ready to eat cereals, the same thing with your sugar content um, for your infants. It's the same for your other ones. Okay, that was an abrupt ending to <laughs> meal patterns. Any questions on meal patterns? You guys are way too quiet for the amount of stuff I'm telling you ha you're having to do differently. I'm concerned we're going to have lots of questions when we start getting into administrative reviews next year. Okay, so administrative reviews, what to expect this year? We've probably already talked about everything. Um, all our reviews are unannounced, as you're already aware, but beginning in fiscal year 22, so it's just this coming year, um, provider reviews will all be conducted unannounced as well. We've kind of been transitioning to that, and it's just been depending on the, the consultants and how they chose to do it, but starting the October, all, all every part of your review is unannounced. You won't be able to announce any of our site reviews to your um, providers beginning October. And like I stressed, if at all possible, go on site to conduct these monitoring reviews. But stay safe. Utilize the waiver when you need to. If you have compromised immune systems, don't go out. And I'm afraid things are only going to get worse before they get better. So we have to have a copy of every grain cereal meat, <sighs> yeah, that a provider may use. That's, that's where I'm saying if you have, if you require um, cycle menu, sorry, I spaced out. If you require cycle menus, that would be where you could, you could have enough detail on some of those, like for your, your grains, like cereals and things, you could at least on your cycle menus, have them include the different cereals that they may serve and make sure that they, they are all creditable cereals, right? So then when they claim each month and they send it in, it's got to be one of those cereals they listed as one they might possibly use. You could have that kind of approach. You know, I think we're, you might all have to find your own way to document these things as long as we have on file what's there so that you've done your best to make sure what they're serving and claiming is creditable. Because if you just put cereal, we have no idea when they recorded that, what, what cereal. And then, then if you the the other thing is if you don't require a cycle menu, you don't even have you don't even have a cycle menu that could have possibly documented the type of cereal you approved them to serve. You know what I'm saying? Same thing with your hot dogs and your lunch meat. So um, 
I know it's going to be a pain. And like with your lunch meats and your hot dogs, that's not going to be a lot of options there because turkey, ham is the only thing that counts really as something that can that's readily available that would count as a, as a lunch meat. So you're not going to have a lot of options there unless they're just counting the cheese. So that's an easy solution to that. You're not going to even, you got to make sure they're using a whole, a, you know, 100% cheese and it's not those craft singles because craft singles that are wrapped individually don't count. Um, it might just be a matter of narrowing down what they can use. I know I'm just talking in circles, but does that answer your question at all, Roseanne? If they specify it on their menu pages they send in, it, uh, yeah, so like for this, like cereal, it would be if they wrote down kicks, you know, kicks we know counts or whatever cereal. If there's enough information documented on there that it is, that would be acceptable. Um, but just some, and the same thing for like, and that's how we've treated it with these reviews going forward or in the past, like if they wrote something that was creditable, but the problem is we're just, there's so much lack of detail on what their claims are being submitted. When it just says ham, ham, well, was it a baked ham? Was it ham lunch meat? Because we know that that is not creditable. I'm still not, I'm not knowing being pretty vague. I think it would be in your best interest to have as much documentation as you can to support the meals you're paying than not but I would still make sure they're being as specific as they can on their menu pages, but you're also limited with the amount of space you have on those forms too. So I'm not sure if that helped you. Um, okay, so, and also constantly remind your providers that, that we can show up at any time. Um, their actions can lead to non-compliance findings and even unfortunately serious deficiency term determinations that could end up jeopardizing you guys. Like um, everybody is just, I know we're all at our wit's end and we're all just trying to cope with what's going on. I get it. And the last thing that these provider wants is somebody showing up at their doorstep to see what they're serving for snacks. But it is what it is. These are federal dollars. We're just doing our job, you know, and we're trying to do it as, as understanding and as well as we can but man some of these on-site reviews we've done i've dealt with some i've dealt with some interesting people i've been doing this with family daycare homes for a long time but i've encountered some of the rudest providers in the last couple of reviews we've done than i've ever have and so i just don't i know they're at their wit's end but you've got to remind them like they've, they've got to be compliant they've got to let us in and and well if they have restrictions that they don't want anyone in their house or if the you know your consultants need to be masked let us know that we can deal with but if they're just mad because we're there and they don't want to let us in like well that's a problem that sends up some really big red flags and so i've just been really surprised at some of the reactions that some of these providers we've had and i know i know like i said we're all just trying to do the best we can. But we're also, you know, we're stewards of tax dollars. You are too. We've got to make sure that these federal dollars are being spent the way they're supposed to. And that's all we're trying to do. So it is a responsibility to make sure they're in compliance with regulations at all times. That doesn't necessarily mean we want you to go in and just iron fist it and say, gotcha. No, if you go in and you're doing a review or you get a claim that's, that's got stuff that isn't quite right, give them some training, but document it, you know, just be like, we've had this issue, we worked on it, here's the training we provided, so that we can see that you're, you know, you're working with them to get them on the right track. We don't want to put people off, like we need people on our programs, that's why we're here. So we just got to do a better job about getting them trained and, and doing what they're supposed to. And then lastly, this question was asked earlier, about emergency funding, it's coming. Um, we're still waiting on approval from national office on our plan. So 
I think we discussed it when we were all together at some point. I don't know. I can't remember. But there was emergency funding that was issued. Um, gosh, it's been several months. We had to come up with all the payments and all the plans for how it's going to work. And the way it works, um, basically, if you had a provider that operated in the months of March, April, May, and June, and then they also operated, or they were at least with you, an active providers in the months of March, April, May, and June of 2020, we take we take the amount they were paid in those months in 19, and we subtract the amount that they were made in those months in 20, and then we multiply that amount by 55%. It's an effort to try to help them recoup the amount of money they lost due to COVID. I surprisingly found a lot of providers um, family daycare homes on this side where their amounts that they were paid in 20 were much higher, which I find intriguing because a lot of our centers close. So um, I don't know. I don't know what's up with that. So you're going to have some providers that are going to get just a little bit or nothing because if they made more in, in those four months in 2020 than they did in 2019, they won't receive a payment for those months. Um, but if they closed or they lost a lot of kids and they made far less in 20 than they did in 19, they basically get, they'll recoup 55% of that loss. And so what we, I mean, it, it just was a nightmare because, you know, in 19, you had a provider that might've been with one sponsor and then 20, they went to another one. Heck, they could already be with another sponsor now. Um, so we still have to pay those. We had to go and line all those payments back up. And so what I'm gonna need help from you guys, no. This is something that I've already calculated all those payments. But what I'm gonna rely on you guys to do is to double check my work. Well, yeah, it, it, if they closed and got unemployment, okay, so yeah. So if they closed, let me back up for a second. So that's how the payment's calculated, but there's a lot of other things that play into the, the eligibility of whether or not they'll get that payment, right? And so at, at some time, later and i'll answer your questions that you guys just asked but sometime later we're all going to have to get together again and have a discussion about this when our plans have been um approved because we just have to wait on national office to approve our plan before we can really even give you say we can't give you anything in writing until it's approved so that's kind of why it's all been hanging in the air so um i really think it's coming really quick we sent our last proposal yesterday and our regional office approved it so it's just waiting at national office right now and once that approval comes we'll get together um because what i need your help in, in doing is double checking my work because i i literally had to do every one of those calculations pretty much it's a big giant spreadsheet but i did them all individually there was no really other way to do it um even for every one of our centers in the state and so i figured each of those amounts and i'm gonna have to break them down and, by sponsors and send it to you guys so you can double check, you know, that because um, there's revisions that have happened or if you had to do, well, anyway, you guys are going to help me with it. We're just not there yet because I can't give it to you. It's not approved. Um, but then there's other things that play into it. So like someone asked if they closed and got unemployment, that unemployment business doesn't really matter to us. What matters is if they closed, are they going to, have they reopened? Are they going to reopen? Because this is a reimbursement and it's, it's, a re, it's supposed to be a reimbursement for costs they incurred, which is crazy because we're paying them for months that they probably may not have operated. So I don't know, it's kind of confusing, but if they, if they closed and they came back and they're currently operating, yes, they'll get that payment. But if they're closed and we don't know, we have to reach out to every, every one of those that you that are going to be on your list that are due for a payment. And we have to contact them and say, hey, are you going to be coming back? And if they say no, then we don't pay them. But if they say, yeah, I'll be coming back. I'm just not ready yet. Then we have to get a signed assurance statement from them that where they're agreeing that, yes, I'll be back. And then we will pay them. Now, what happens if they, they do that and then they pay them? It, you're not going to be held responsible. We're still waiting for guidance on USDA to how to handle that. Like, okay, so we determined a payment. They signed an assurance and said, yes, I'll be coming back. And then they never do. 
we don't know. We have no idea what happens with that. So it's like I said, it's not it's not held up. I mean, it's, you guys aren't held responsible for it. But what will happen is once we double check all the payments, um, the lump sums will get paid to you guys, and then you will have to pay make those payments to the providers in the amount that that we've determined. So that will be something that y'all might have to figure out because it's going to be a challenge for us. So we're going to have to make the payments in a little different manner to you guys than what we normally would. It'll be outside of our system. I mean, it'll still be directly deposited in your accounts like we normally would, but it wouldn't go through our CACFP system because our system's not equipped to make a payment to you guys that's not related to a claim. And these aren't, these aren't a revision. It's not an original claim. So those of you that are on Kid Care, Minute Menu, what have you, or any other type of system, if, if you're only set up to make a payment, that's associated with a claim, you're going to have to find out some other way to make a payment, whether it's just a handwritten check to pay those. Um, no, that, well, I say that, that is a question that we sent to USDA, and like, if you guys know anything about USDA, we're always waiting on further guidance, but our understanding is no, um, these funds won't count towards your 750000 if you have to get an audit or not, because what we're paying you is um, is operational costs anyway. So that wouldn't count towards what would be considered your administrative funds. But with that said, we also calculated payments, you know, as a sponsor, you guys will get some emergency funding too. So um, some there are some sponsors where you won't get anything because we do have some sponsors where you did make more in those months in 20 than you did in 19. And when that happened, you don't get a payment. But the vast majority of you will be getting a payment for admin funds as well. And that will be included in the spreadsheet I send you. Um, so that would go, be counted towards it. But it's, I think the biggest, there, it wasn't over $3,000 was the, one of the highest payments that a uh, sponsor is getting. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a great huge benefit. It's really not for a lot of your providers either, but some is better than nothing. But yes, and it really does only benefit the ones that closed, which is a bummer because it's the same thing with our schools. We had schools that stuck it out and busted their tails. And because of that, they're not getting any of that funding, just like some of our daycares that just stuck it out and, and you know, made it through the pandemic and they're not going to get anything because they didn't, they didn't lose any um, revenue. So that is an accurate statement. Um, so like I said, SDE will be sending the full payments of what you guys are like your admin amount if you're getting any and all the funding for all your providers, it'll be sent to you in a lump sum and then you'll be responsible for sending out the individual checks. The ones that stayed open will not be happy about it. I agree. There's not, I mean, but it's not a darn thing we can do about it. Fortunately, that's what happens when you have um, administration that makes up, has ideas that haven't operated programs. <laughs> kind of a tacky thing to say, but it's unfortunate. There'll be a lot of unhappy um, people. And then, um, you know, some of them, it will help them because if they really did close and they're trying to get back up on their feet, it's going to be great for them. Um, but really, overall, family daycare homes, there wasn't any astronomically huge numbers they're getting paid. So, because a lot of them, like I said, seem to make more in 20. And maybe that's because a lot of our centers closed and family daycare homes picked up the slack. I don't know. I, I just I found that really interesting when I was doing all those calculations. Um, but you're not going to be just, we're not just going to give you this money and say, here, figure it out. Um, it's it's going to be very um, detailed later. You're going to get instructions on how this is going to work. We kind of have to have your plan on how, um, how you plan to do things. And if you don't, if you can even decline the admin money, if what we're paying you, if you don't need it, you can decline it and not accept it if you're worried about going over your 750,000 limit. Um, but those payments that admin, the admin fees you guys are getting, it, they're just, they're pretty minimal, unfortunately. Um, I anticipate maybe in the next couple of weeks, we'll have to be getting together and um, our amounts were approved, and I'm going to talk to Jennifer, so I think I can probably get these spreadsheets to you guys for you to start looking at them now. 
when I send you the spreadsheets, you don't have to do anything. I would advise you not to share those amounts with your providers in the event something were to happen. I just need to get them to you so you can double check my work and make sure that those providers on the list are still active providers with you, that you have the ability to pay them and which ones are not that we'll have to get those assurance statements from. So we have kind of nowhere to start. Um, so that should be coming pretty soon. Any other questions on that? Oh, we got the rates. Did we get the commodity rate today? Yes. Right. Oh, yes. we did? Oh, good. Yes. Maybe that's what my email, my phone's been blowing up about. <laughs> Jennifer sent it out today. Great. Okay. So that means we don't have to take down claims. We don't have to worry about that. So we got all our rates and everything will operate as normal. Great. We'll send those rates out and we'll send them to you guys here. I don't know. We'll send the memo after Jennifer types up the memo, Karen, we'll send them out to them so you guys can have the new rates. Any other questions? If you guys want the um, copy of this, the link when this recording is done, we can send it to you. Just send me an email or if you want, I'll just, we can just have Karen send it to everyone just in case. And if at any, any time you guys have questions or you need help, if you need some training on site or Zoom, like that's what we're here for. Don't wait until the time of, of an administrative review. Don't wait and be afraid. If you're afraid you're doing something wrong, just ask us and let us help you get it, you know, let us help you get it going. Um, and again, I know I've said this more than once, I encourage you to sign up for the August 5th food buying guide training. It's going to help you. We're working on those cheat sheets. Um, we want to make it easier for you and your providers to understand. Um, I hope in the future, I've gone on several reviews um, to, to many of you guys, and I, ha I haven't made it yet to come help with a review. I'll be seeing you at some point in the next couple of years because I, I really want to get to work with all of you on site and in person. So um, just let me know if you have any other questions. And if not, that's all I've got today. Thank you guys so much. Reach out to me if you have any questions. Appreciate you all.